And today, the summer season comes to you live from Brooklyn, Michigan, home of the Indi Michigan International Speedway. Today, the Michigan 500 for IndyCars. Hello, everyone. I'm Bruce Jenner, and we've got an exciting show for you here on the summer season. Today, it's the first live television broadcast ever of a IndyCar 500-mile race. And I know the drivers are ready, and everybody involved with the production is excited about bringing you this show. And today, if time and circumstances permit, we're also going to do a, a baseball strike update and some thoroughbred racing from England. But we've got a lot of things to do today, so let's get on the move. Right now, up to our host, Charlie Jones and Paul Page. Hi, thank you, Bruce. It seems like only a week ago, Paul, that we were standing right here before we were rudely interrupted by Mother Nature. So we had to wait six extra days for television sports history. And that, of course, the Michigan 500, the first live flag-to-flag -flag coverage of an IndyCar race at a distance of 500 miles. A 500-mile race is always an exciting thing. This one especially so, because it's the inaugural event. And perhaps more exciting for the drivers and the crews is the purse is over $500,000, over $100,000 to the winner. And that is second only to the purse offered at the Indianapolis 500. The weather here today, it is warm, muggy, a bit hazy, but the sun is out. That is different than it was last Sunday when this race was scheduled and we were inundated by the rain. Well, the rain, of course, caused problems for the drivers and the crews. It meant an extra week here. That's an added expense. It also compressed the rest of the schedule for them, less preparation time for the next race. The rain we thought was going to end early, but then it didn't. The clouds opened up, and we had rain that rained out the first day. The crews have now have had a week to work on the cars. They've also had one day of practice. For some, that was a help. For others, a hindrance. Yeah, it, uh, you know, if we'd have started the race last weekend and just went directly into the race like we were planning on, we'd have uh, had some problems during the race. So we went out in this hour practice session this morning. We found out some brackets were breaking it to support the tunnels on the side pods on the side of the car. And uh, just lucky for us that we did have another practice session before the race. Well, I'm quite sure they gained some, you know, because we was all set to go Sunday. And uh, at least they got to feel what the track was like the day after the rain and all. So we're going to have to start kind of cold turkey. It's going to hurt us a little bit. Well, we were ready to go racing when the, when the gun was going to fly, but uh, we were sort of happy to see it because we didn't have as much time on the track as some of the teams, and so it gave us an opportunity to look at some things and, and make a couple little variations and uh, come back and even be a little quicker this week than we were last week. 250 laps over this two-mile oval, and now we're going to turn it over to the president of the company that sponsors this race, Donald Melville, and racing's most famous command. Gentlemen, start your engines. begins to build on the grid for the start of the Michigan 500. Each of these cars roars out its challenge to one another. Over 25,000 horsepower represented by these machines. The crews raising their hands, indicating that they are now ready to go. Pancho Carter sitting so calmly in his machine. Johnny Rutherford is ready. We're ready for the start of the Michigan 500. On the front row, Tom Sneva on the pole. Johnny Rutherford and Rick Mears will be outside of him. There is Steve Krisiloff. He is driving the machine of Mario Andretti. Krisiloff still looking for his first win as the cars start to very slowly edge out of the pits. This will be the first of three laps before we see the green flag. A race of 500 miles, a story could well be told in the pits. Bruce Jenner is there, as is Gary Gerald. Let's go down to Gary right now. Charlie, I'll tell you, these crews, these drivers, for the second time of the week, now anxiously awaiting this very moment. The intensity level way up. They're looking to something that's never been experienced before, the prospect of 500 miles on the banks of Michigan International Speedway. Track temperature just minutes ago, 100 degrees. That's almost ideal. It should not be any type of a problem. But the demands of the racetrack are something else. And with that aspect of the story, let's go to our colleague in the pits, Bruce Jenner. 
Gary, the reason this track is difficult for him being banked is on a conventional flat track, the, tr the cars in the turn are forced centrifugally to the outside of the turn. Now that same turn is banked. That centrifugal force now pushes the car down onto the track. In fact, yesterday I was out driving around the track. You can see places where actually the cars have been pushed down so hard onto the track that they had dug some of the pavement up from underneath. So it's going to be difficult for these cars to go 500 miles on this bank track. All right, let's go back up to Charlie. 37 cars on the starting grid. All of the top drivers are here with the exception of Andretti and Angaius. So right now, let's set the field for the Michigan 500. The front row qualified at better than 200 miles an hour. Tom Snape on the pole at 201.359. A march, a new car this year. The defending national champion, Johnny Rutherford, is in the center of the row, car number one, the yellow chaparral. Some think the best starting position is the outside of the row. Rick Mears is there and eager to lead the first lap. In the second row, we have a total of 67 wins. Inside in car number five in his eighth year racing Indy cars, Pancho Carter. He is not one. In the middle is Steve Krisilov in car number 40. That is Mario Andretti's car. Krisilov is yet to win. And outside number 14, A.J. Boyd. 67 wins, four-time Indianapolis champion. Row three averages 196 miles an hour. A happy but surprised Bill Alsop is on the inside and his team Penske number seven. The factory march entry is in the middle of row three. Bill Whittington is driving his first IndyCar ride on the high banks. The outside, Bobby Unser. Mechanical problems slow disqualification, but he should move up fast at the start. His brother Al Unser is inside on row four and Al has 36 wins to his credit. In the middle is the rookie, Kevin Kogan. Yet to win, but still the fifth leading money winner this year. And outside is Mike Mosley, who won at Milwaukee this year in car number 48. On the inside of the fifth row, with three career victories at this track, car number 20, Gordon Johncock. He should make an early move to the front. And then if he is smart, Mike Chandler in number 74 will follow Johncock through. Then Billy Engelhardt on the outside of the row should fall in behind Chandler. Now let's take a look at the rest of the field. In row six, Larry Cannon, Bob Lazier, and Gary Bettenhausen. We expect Gary to be up among the early leaders. The seventh row inside is Jose Lee Garza, the rookie of the year at Indianapolis this year. The second Bettenhausen, Tony, is there, as is the veteran Tom Bigelow. There are two stock blocks in the eighth row, those of Jerry Carl and Herm Johnson. Larry Dixon has a conventional-powered Cosworth machine. We expect him to move up early. In the ninth row, Vern Schupan has a Cosworth engine. Bill Vukovic and Dick Ferguson both have Oppenhauser four-cylinder-powered machines. In row 10, the rookie is in the middle. That is Chip Mead. The veteran saw Walter. He is on the inside and watch car number 21 to make an early move. Outside is Dick Simon. In row 11, the rookie is inside. That is Scott Brayton in car number 37. The veterans are Roger Rager and Cliff Hugo. In the 12th and 13th row, we have those cars that have been added by the promoter's option. In the 12th row, Steve Chassis and Bill Tempero were the alternates. Harry McDonald got into the race as a result of his position in finishing a qualifying race, as did the lone car in the 13th row, Phil Kaleva. In car number seven, Bill Olsen. The camera is on board, and this is what it looks like. An incredible picture. That is just about four inches off the track surface. The camera down in the nose of the car. You're looking at it live. There is Bill Alsop. The camera in his car, the first time it has ever been done in an indie type car. Waving to the crowds, this is the shot. He is inside in row three. This is live from the car of Bill Alsop. Just in front, in the center of the front row, you can see the bright yellow of Johnny Rutherford's car as the front row perfectly aligned. Tom Sneva on the pole, Johnny Rutherford alongside. The field is looking in just perfect condition. This track is banked all the way around. The back straight is banked at five degrees. That's the only straight there is. The turns are banked at 18 degrees. The front straight, although it flattens out when you look at it, is banked at 12 degrees. The pace car has now turned off its yellow flashing lights, and that means that we are ready for a start. Currently here, it is 82 degrees. The humidity up a bit at 69%. There's 30% chance of precipitation. It is cloudy and overcast. The track surface temperature is just over 100 degrees. 
The front row, Tom Sneeve on the pole, Johnny Rutherford, and then Rick Mears. Second row is Poncho Carter, Steve Kristoloff, and A.J. Foyt. Third row, Bill Alsa, Bill Whittington, and Bobby Unser as we await the green flag. They come between turns three and turn four. And we look for the second lap to be over 200 miles an hour today. The pace car is off the race course. The pole sitter, Tom Sneva, brings them down. He's waiting for the green flag. The starter gives the green flag, and the first Michigan 500 for Indy cars is underway. And as Tom Sneva moves out in the front. Rutherford goes behind him and stays high through the first turn and dropping back is Rick Mayer. It is Sneva and Rutherford in the early going. As they go through turn two, Rutherford tucks right in behind Tom Sneva. Tom Sneva leads down the back stretch. It's Johnny Rutherford right behind him. And Steve Kresselhoff has moved up to do battle with Rick Mears in first place. But here is one and two. Tom Sneva and Johnny Rutherford through the first turn, the second turn, now through the third, heading through the fourth. And Sneva is showing a definite advantage here in the early going as Tom Sneva comes around to lead the first of 250 laps. Johnny Rutherford in second place, Steve Kristoloff in third, Rick Mears is in fourth. Pancho Carter follows him, A.J. Boyd, Bill Alsop in that order. Ever so smoothly now as Tom Steva begins to pull out just a bit more from second place Johnny Rutherford. We've got trouble in turn number two, a car sliding. Got up high and then back on the race course. So in the first lap, we have a yellow flag at the conclusion of lap number one. The yellow flag is out. Tom Sneva will slow. Apparently, Larry Cannon got sideways in the second turn. So Tom Sneva comes down across the line, acknowledging the yellow flag. Johnny Rutherford right behind him. A lap and a quarter, Charlie, and we have our first yellow. We were surprised in reality that it lasted that long. We thought we might have one on the first lap. Well, there was a lot of concern for the start of this race with three of abreast 37 cars crowded, a high-speed race course, and they're not really sure, as they would like to be, about the, the surface of this racetrack. It rained. That took all of the uh, surface that was ground in in the early practice away. They had a very short practice, and so now they have to find out about the track. Larry Cannon into the pits. He was the one that had the problem. Left 11th year of champ car racing. Still has no wins, and he is 44 years of age. I mention that because this is not a young man's sport. No, it's certainly not. Who have been winning for so long in the past few years all have a great deal of age on them. Uh, a great deal to someone like me, to you, Charlie, maybe not so much. Well, they're but very young, they're kids. Johnny, Johnny Rutherford, Bobby Unzer, Al Unzer, all of them uh, well up over their 40s. Bobby Unzer is 47 years old. In fact, a third of the field is 40 or over. The reason being the growth of safety in auto racing. They're simply living a lot longer. There's no question about that. Bobby Unzer will joke about it, but it's a very serious comment that the cars are much safer and therefore the survival rate seems to be higher. So the field coming around now, that is Tom Sneva out in front, Johnny Rutherford tucked in right behind him. They should be able to come back to the green flag rather rapidly as Cannon was able to bring the car in. A quick check of the race course for debris, putting the emergency equipment back in place, and then we should be able to go right back to green flag racing. And the official standings for the top five through three laps, of course, two of them being under the yellow, Steve Rutherford, Krisilov, Mears, and then Carter. A lap and a quarter and a yellow flag at the Michigan 500. This gives the crews a chance to settle down a little bit more. Of course, it would be much too early for anyone to even begin to consider a pit stop unless something was seriously wrong on the race car. Now, the indications are that the pace car will head off at the conclusion of this lap, and we will be back to green flag racing once again, beginning at lap number four. Tom Sneva, the pull sitter, 201.359 miles an hour. Now, in the older days, with a higher boost into these turbocharged engines, Tom Sneva has the track record from those earlier times at over 211 miles an hour. So he is now ready to bring his machine down through the third turn. Johnny Rutherford sits in right behind them, and already they will begin to line themselves up so they are prepared for the start. The pace car has pulled into the pit area, and Tom Sneva now begins to pick up the power and the speed, and Johnny Rutherford doesn't want to let him get too far away. Rutherford is beginning to tuck in right behind Tom Sneva. Sneva is coming off the fourth turn, looking for the the green flag, the green flag is out, and once again we are racing at Michigan International Speedway. 
So it is Rutherford going high after Stephen turn one and Johnny has a. So Rutherford moves in the first place with Steve running second. Kristoloff is running third. He was challenged by Rick Mears, but he held Mears off and he is in fourth place. So Rutherford leads for the first time. Another car spinning in front of the field in the second turn. Up toward the wall. That is Bill Whittington, I believe, car number 94. It was Whittington that we expected so much out of in the early going. You can see he was hit and hit hard. He is still in the cockpit of the car. The front right wheel is sitting askew. The wing is askew. Whittington moving his head. Now he's apparently going to try and release the brake and let the car roll down off the banking so that he can get out of the way. So right off the top, two problems. Larry Cannon, who was the cause of the first yellow light, moves back into the competition, but Bill Whittington had to let his number 94 roll off of the high banking and come to a stop. He will occupy the last position because he is the first car officially out of the day. That car will not race. Let's try and look at it one more time. Whittington just simply lost it high, and there was a tense moment here as Whittington was in front of a number of cars that had to duck very low to get past him. Fortunately, there was no contact with other equipment. Whittington stopped right there and later let the car roll down off of the racetrack. Any particular reason the early problems have been in turn two? Well, again, it's a situation where we don't know exactly what this race course is doing. There was a short practice yesterday, but the rain of last week washed all of the rubber off the race course, and so they're running a little hard, a little hot. They're not really sure where the racetrack is this early. They better find it pretty quick. And what did it look like if you were driving in the race? Bill Alsop with the onboard camera. Look oh, at that, right oh. across the front. Incredible shot from the live onboard camera as Bill Whittington lost it right in front of Bill Alsop, and that's, that's when the driver really sucks in the breath. And what you have to do, Charlie, is simply drive on your line. Here are the official standings through lap number six. Rutherford leads it. We'll be back in a moment. Official standings through six laps. It is Rutherford in front, Tom Sneba, Krisilov, Mears, and Carter. Now, the action were, was in turn two. All of the eyes went to Bill Whittington to see what happened there. Meanwhile, in turn three, Paul Pay. Well, apparently, Gordon Johncock got just a piece of the problem created by Whittington and smacked something. His car is now on the hook in turn three, and Gordon Johncock, who was certainly planning to do very well in this race and had every opportunity, he has, after all, won three major events here, is out of the race very, very early on. Let's go down to the pits now and Gary Gerald. Paul, we're here with Jim McGee, the crew chief for Patrick Racing, and uh, Jim's been anxiously watching a monitor trying to ascertain just what's happened. Uh, Jim, your impressions from your radio conversation with Gordy, any indication as to what happened there? Well, evidently, uh, uh, Whittington spun in front of him, and uh, Gordy just caught him trying to miss him, so uh, he said it took the right front wheel and damaged it, so that kind of puts us out. Really an awful tough way to be starting an afternoon that I know you all were looking forward to so much. Yeah, we made some uh, changes in the car, and Gordy was pretty satisfied with it the first couple of laps that we run, so, uh, you know, we were looking forward to running a little bit longer. All right, thank you, Jim. I know it's a tough day for you. Let's swing to the other end of the pit now and Bruce Jenner. Yeah, yeah, Gary, I'm with uh, Bill Burton, Larry Cannon's uh, crew chief, and what happened in that uh, he's been in already three times? We've got a wing situation. Uh, yesterday we was running real good with the wings the way they were. Today we've created some more heat out on the racetrack, and the car is just not like it was yesterday, so we're having a wing problem. We've raised the rear wing one turn up. We lo uh, lowered the wing three turns uh, down, and now we put it back up to where it is, so we're going to go ahead and try it this way. We've got a real wing problem here, and I don't did, know what's going on. Did to Larry do. say that the track was slippery? Because turn two seems to be giving everybody trouble. Yes, it's, it's a little slippery out there. As you, you see, it's a lot hotter today, and that creates problems with uh, right on down the line from engines right on down. All right, thanks a lot, Bill. Thank Let's you. go back to Charlie. All right, thank you, Bruce. Drivers will tell you that if an accident happens in front of you, drive right at it because the car will be gone. So you can see the onboard camera, Bill Alsop, the accident in front. He drives right at the accident and misses the car. 
and gets through cleanly. Unfortunately, Gordon Johncock did not. The lights are off on the pace car. They have cleaned up that debris from Bill Whittington's accident, and they are ready to go. That's too bad for Bill Whittington because in yesterday's practice, he was running a full mile an hour faster than he qualified the car. So it has to be a sad moment for Whittington, as well as for Gordon Johncock, who really wanted to do well here, certainly had the capability. Those two cars out of the race in the early going. The pace car is off the race course, and now they're bringing them down to the green. This time it is Johnny Rutherford that will lead them to the green flag. And jumping underneath Rutherford is Tom Sneva. And Rutherford stays high, and Rutherford holds him off down the front straight, which is banked. It is banked at 12 degrees as Rutherford goes into turn one. Sneva is running second. Chris Olaf is third. Rick Mears is running fourth. And the three cars side by side are battling for fifth as they sort it out in the middle of the pack. Now Tom Sneva begins to close ever so much on the back of Johnny Rutherford's car. And Sneva beginning to make a charge as they head for the third turn. Sneva a bit lower on the race course. He's been able to run lower in the corners than Rutherford, but not this time. Rutherford slides her high at over 190 miles an hour. Here comes Sneva making his charge. Rutherford just a bit too high as Sneva is getting around Rutherford, and Sneva will come around and lead lap number 10. So Tom Sneva leading once again, though they are still battling, going into the first turn. It is Sneva continuing to lead Rutherford, and they are beginning to disappear from Steve Krisiloff and Rick Mears and a group of cars that are sitting back back now almost 150 yards behind them. Rutherford going through turn two backed off a little bit from Sneva. So Sneva now has opened the gap the length of a football field. And we point that out because in that back straight if you blink your eye one time you have gone 100 yards. Here is the battle behind the leaders as we see Sneva and Rutherford coming by in the bottom of your picture. But here is Steve Krisiloff, Rick Mears, Concho Carter, and Mike Mosley. That is really a battle for third place as Mosley goes low and now sets his sight on the back end of, of Krisiloff's car. Mosley is in a stock block powered Eagle, a Dan Gurney design and creation, a stock block they've worked very hard on, and it is beginning to pay off now. Though the durability of this engine has still been in question, certainly its ability to race is not in question. The battle for third. Mike Mosley pulling down just inside Steve Krisiloff and in the first turn forces his way past. So now Mike Mosley has moved into third. Mike Mosley with five victories to his credit in his IndyCar racing career has one win this year and that was at Milwaukee. So it is Tom Sneva, Johnny Rutherford and then Mike Mosley followed by Steve Krisiloff. They are the top four cars. Mike Mosley still in third place and pulling away from Steve Krisiloff, but now we're seeing a challenge on Krisiloff's machine as Bobby Unser begins to move up through the field. Mike Mosley will be a question mark throughout the afternoon. There is fourth place, Krisiloff and Bobby Unser beginning to close on him. So it is. It will be an entire afternoon, Charlie. The question will be whether or not the cars will live. They say they want to pace their way through the race. Mike Mosley now pulling up to challenge Johnny Rutherford in the first turn. It's a challenge for second place. There is Mosley moving past Johnny Rutherford and now has set his sights on the leader, Tom Sneva. So it is Tom Sneva now, Mike Mosley second. Johnny Rutherford is running third, a three-way battle for fourth. Sneva continues to lead very comfortably. Pancho Carter challenging Steve Krisiloff. Carter is running in fifth place. Carter and Krisiloff getting in quite an argument now for fifth place as Carter on the high side and his number five machine forces its way past Steve Krisiloff. Moving up right behind on the inside now is Rick Mears. So they're locked in battle here for this position as well as up in the lead. Now that they have gotten clear of their yellow flag problems in the start, the race has begun to settle down and run smoothly. And we're seeing a lot of battling. Here's first and second. Tom Sneva on the left of your screen. Mike Mosley in the stock block who won the last kart race at Milwaukee just two weeks ago and is doing very, very well here today. That stock block closes up on the back. Looking back in the field now, here is the battle for fifth place as Steve Krisiloff is trying to hold off Rick Mears, who is sitting right behind him. And Rick's teammate, Bobby Unzer, pulls in to join this battle. So team cars of Roger Penske side by side, both with their sights set on Steve Krisiloff. We have 15 laps complete. It's a 250 lap race, so a lot of racing still to go, 235 laps left. 
We are live from the Michigan International Speedway. This is the Michigan 500, the first time in television sports history that an IndyCar race at 500 miles has been carried live. Continuing to watch battles back in the pack, and we will try to bring them to you as they become available to us. Here is Steve Krisilov as he is still trying to hold off both Rick Mears and Bobby Unzer. And it is quite a fight that he is having to just hold on to that fifth place position. Currently the leader is Tom Sneva. Mike Mosley has moved up into second place. Johnny Rutherford dropped back to third. And now Mosley beginning to close even more on the back end of Tom Sneva's car. So a tremendous battle for the lead. And down in Dan Gurney's pits, let's go to Bruce Jenner. I'm with Mike Mosley's crew chief right now, designer of the car, a man who's no stranger to racing, Dan Gurney. And Mike, right now, the car is running beautifully. Yes, he is. I'm a little bit surprised at how rapidly he's going. I know he's trying to be comfortable, and we realize it's a long race. We're very happy where he is. So. Do you think the car has a long enough fuse to make it? Well, it's as long as we know how to make, and uh, we're going to find out. I don't think anyone knows at this point. We sure hope so. Your guys are going to win. Well, that's what it takes. You have to go all the way. <laughs> okay, good luck to you. Thank you, Bruce. And now they work their way through lap traffic through turn three and head for turn four. Mike Mosley in car number 48 is currently running second. Tom Steven, car number two, is the leader. Johnny Rutherford in car number one, who was inside of the first row, led in the early going. It was Steva, then Rutherford, and then Steva back in the lead. There's less than half a second now separating these two cars. Barely the wink of an eye as Tom Sneva threads himself past Steve Chassis in the lap traffic, and Mike Mosley follows right on through. As a result of the yellow flags in the early going, they're only averaging just over 110 miles an hour. At lap number 10, they were averaging 97.56 miles an hour. Now Mike Mosley continues his bid to lead this inaugural Michigan 500. But Tom Steva is doing everything he can to prevent it. Barely half a second actually closing now to point. 2-5, 25 one hundredths of a second separating the cars. Billy Engelhardt, number 29, pulls in for some service. That is early for a pit stop. We really don't expect stops for fuel until lap 30. So if Engelhardt is in this early, there is probably something wrong with the machine. The positions number one and two remain the same. Tom Sneva and Mike Mosley. Tom Sneva, he is one of the young Titans that Paul has talked about. He's 33 years of age. 11th year for riding champ cars. He has a total of four wins. Twice he has been national champion. Tom Steven, car number two. Mike Mosley has been working very hard with Dan Gurney on this incredible machine that they have built, the stock block powered Eagle. They've worked very hard and at some great expense with that stock block to try and develop it. They are in hopes that once the engine is developed, that it will only cost about $20,000 to be able to race as compared with the between $37,000 and $45,000 of the Cosworth engine. The development has been very costly. Dan Gurney has had some very hard times, but it's a pleasure to see this fine driver and fine team here at Michigan International Speedway. Mike Mosley. Now sitting right on the back end of Tom Sneva's car. 21 laps are now complete. Mosley, a quiet young gentleman in racing. He has enjoyed his racing so much, but he is rather, rather peaceful about it. He doesn't brag. He sits quietly and waits. He lets the race car do its talking. Bill Whittington went out of the race early, and he's now with Gary Gerald. Gary? Well, here's Bill Whittington, and Bill, we're glad to see that you're all right. Any indication of what the problem was? Uh, no, I just, the uh, first indication, I just wanted to get out of there. You know, those cars coming by so fast that uh, you don't really have time to look at it and see what happened, you know, and just uh, kind of stared your hair on end. You had run so well, you have limited experience in these type of cars, your first time at this track. You were second fast yesterday. This has to be a great disappointment. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's hard to say. Well, we appreciate the fact that you're all right. Hi. We'll go back up to the booth now. Thank you. All right, thank you, Gary. Tom Sneva continuing to lead Mike Mosley, and Mosley tries Sneva underneath as they come through the turn. Sneva holds him off. But Mosley has position, then he slips in behind him. They run into lap traffic. 
report coming up from the pit area since we had mentioned Billy Engelhardt in the pits they have pushed the car behind the wall and Billy Engelhardt is out of the race. Tom Sneva with Mike Mosley chasing him. We should not be that far from a pit stop now. 23 laps are now complete. Roger Penske told us yesterday he wants to be conservative and get his cars in at lap 30. So we'll be looking forward to the pits coming in in just a few laps. And Mike Mosley and Tom Sneva going around slower traffic, but Sneva is able to hold them off as they come around Jerry Carl. It looked for a moment like Mosley might have picked up first place, but Sneva still maintains first. So it is Sneva and Mike Mosley locked in the battle in the early going. 24 laps complete. 100, uh, 226 laps to go. Sneva and Mosley. They have remained in these relative positions quite steadily through the race, coming up, trying one another, and then dropping back. Let's go down to the pit area where Gary Gerald now has Gordon Johncock. Thank you, Paul. Gordy, what happened? We understand you were in the traffic when the car spun. Uh, Whittington spun uh, in the center of one. Gordy, we've got a problem here, I believe, in the track. We're going to go back up to the booth. We've got all kinds of problems between turn one and turn two. A car went high in trouble. Another car trying to stay away from came low and spun into the infield. Poncho Carter down on the grass. That is Larry Dixon sitting up high trying to get restarted. It looked to me like an engine let go. This should bring in pit stop. It's an ideal time for everybody. And indeed, Salt Walter and Steve Chassis have come in. Now we're watching to see if the leaders will come in. First and second place. Both heading down the pit road and for their pits. Tom Sneva leads Mike Mosley in. The crews are ready. The tires are laid out. Now Tom Sneva ducks in. He's ready for some fast service. Johnny Rutherford is also in. Mike Mosley is in. Steve Krisiloff. So all of the front running cars, unfortunately, Poncho Carter, who was running in the first five, is a part of the accident in the second turn. And so now, as Tom Sneva is first to get away, the lead is being picked up on the race course. Tom Sneva will have to move to get out of this pit as fast as he can. The leader at this moment is Bill Alsop. So he, as a result of not pitting while the rest of the leaders are in, Alsop has picked up the lead. A.J. Foyt also came in on a pit stop. Dick Simon came in. He's headed back out. So we're still under the yellow with 26 laps complete. Charlie will have to wait and watch and see what also decides. He's the leader at the moment by nature of this pit stop. He's not made a stop. The rest of the leaders have. And let's see if that onboard camera might be working. It should be exciting. There you see it right behind the pace car. Also moving into position. And we'll see if he peels off now and heads down into the pit. Indeed, he does. Bill also heading down that pit road, staring head on into the pit area at about 150 miles an hour. And he'll grind it to a stop and chalk it over into position. There's his crew member ready as they come to a stop. And Bill also is in the pits. That sign held up to tell him exactly where to stop so that all of the lines reach the car. Alsop's machine up in the air. Work being done on it. No change of tires. They fuel it. And Bill Alsop will roll underway once again. He's, he's faltered there. It looks like that engine was not start. We'll be back. And we have a fire in Herm Johnson's pit. It started when he was fueling and it spread behind the wall. Johnson was in for a regular refuel and then suddenly the car burst into flame and now they have a fire that is burning all around the fuel tank in Herm Johnson's pit. We had some crew members suffering some slight some slight injury. We don't have any indication as to their injury. It did not look as if Johnson was injured. But look at this tremendous fire as the entire pit goes up. They have been trying to fight it now for almost a minute. There was an explosion. Tank, tank an explosion went. as one of the tanks went. Apparently, Herm Johnson's tank let go at the front. Now, most of the people moved away. But an explosion in the pits as Herm Johnson's tank did catch fire. And a tire let go. We don't know if the explosion was the result of a tire or is the tank. The tank looks to be intact. They have done everything they can to keep the fire from spreading. The scoring stand is what is actually showing the most fire, though you can't see an alcohol fire. And there is no telling where else there might be fire burning. That white smoke that you're seeing is the Purple K powder that they use to fight the fire. And in reality, it smothers the fire, draws the oxygen out. And this is something that they've always been afraid of. Up 
wherever championship cars run. Now they have closed the pits as a result of this fire. The pits are completely blocked. The cars will have to stay on the course. That brings the question. If I didn't bring my car in for a stop, what happens to me if I run out of fuel on the racetrack? I can't get to my pit. They continue to fight this fire. This has been what they have been afraid of in all of IndyCar racing for so long. A major fire in the pits. They're now bringing in heavy apparatus. Big fire trucks coming in. Let's go down to Bruce Jenner, who's on the scene. Down here in the pits right now, pandemonium has just broke out. It looks like uh, his pit has completely gone up and the fire tanks and the tanks are on fire right now. They're trying to put it out. They've got about four or five units, a lot of people working around there, but it's a lot of pandemonium. Everybody's just sort of clearing out of the area and trying to see what happens. But right now, it's a terrible sight from down here. Charlie? All right, Bruce, it seems as if they may have it a little under control, but it is still burning. Let's go back moments ago to the, how it started. Now let's go down to Gary. Here's Herm Johnson. Herm, I know you're walking in to get some emergency attention. Any idea what happened on that stop? I just saw a fuel spill and it flared up and and it was just burning. And we gotta go, Gary. We got a we gotta couple go. a Come lot on. hurt worse than me. Oh, sorry, all right, thank you, Herm Johnson. They're taking him in for some emergency aid at this point. He seems to be all right. He has some superficial burns, it would appear, around the face. He'll get some emergency treatment here, and we'll try to update the information, of course, as it's available. You see her now the replay of that fire. That is his refueler. After the fire at Indianapolis, several of the crews bought new helmets to try and prevent the crew members from being burned in case this happened in a refuel. Apparently, it did some good, though obviously by the way he was jumping around, he was suffering from the heat, probably being burned to a small degree. I want to be very careful, Charlie, not to alarm anyone until we know exactly what happened. The red flag is about to be displayed at Michigan International Speedway. The red flag is out. They are stopping this race. This will change the strategies of everybody drastically. So here's the situation. We have officially 29 laps complete of 250 laps at the Michigan 500. So we'll take a timeout and we'll be back here to pick up the race, which is currently under the red flag. We'll be back in a moment. We're back at Michigan International Speedway where we have had a tremendous fire in the pits. It started when Hearn Johnson's car caught fire during refueling. It spread rapidly to the tank that refuels Herm Johnson's car and then spread up and down the pit area. We had a loud report, a blast from the pits that for a moment we thought was a tank going up. It turned out instead to be a tire exploding was our latest report. But you can see the tank actually moved a bit as part of the hose caught fire and then exploded. Fortunately, there is a safety shutoff valve between the hose and the front of the tank. So the tank still has its integrity. But we have had injuries here. We have stopped the race. We have closed off the pit area. And they have several individuals who have been injured as a result of this. At least one was the refueler from Herm Johnson's machine. And in addition, the fire has spread up and down the pits as far as four or five pits away. Some of the, uh, the, the of the crew members have uh, caught fire and then have been put out, uh, had the fire put out around them. Now let's go down to Bruce Jenner. Bruce? Charlie, Johnny Rutherford is with me. And Johnny, this is something you don't like to see in racing. No, you really don't. Of course, it's uh, especially in the pits where there are so many people confined and, and gathered. It's uh, makes it a little tough and you wonder where it is immediately my thoughts were to my pit and Betty and uh, and what might be going on there but they were far enough away uh, Jim Hall the owner told me that uh, they weren't in any danger but it's really a shame and I think it's time we really had an inquiry into uh, yeah, do you think situation. they should look in to see it uh, they can yes. do something about this yes definitely because uh, I was down there at the pits and it looked like when they were pulling the fueler off a lot like what happened to mirrors the gas spread all over and then they were in trouble and it spread on the ground and spread everywhere and it started going from one pit to the next. Yes, and that's, that's a problem. We uh, we obviously have got to look at the way we refuel these cars and, and make them better. All right, how was it out there on the track? Well, it's a little slippery. Uh, we had a few spin-outs in the first few laps. Yes, I think the guys uh, were caught unawares and uh, my car wasn't handling like it was uh, even yesterday in practice, so we're, we're working on it, and uh, I think we'll be right when we restart. All right, well, everything seems to be the, the fire's out from right now from what we can see. They're still trying to cool down the gas tanks. Let's go back up to Charlie. 
All right, thank you, Bruce. The Michigan 500 has been stopped at this point in time due to the fire in the pits that started when Herm Johnson came into the pits, got loose from him, spread through three or four pits. They have now brought in a regular large fire truck which has laid out hoses all the way through. There you see the white and red fire apparatus. Both of them are pumpers capable of delivering thousands of gallons per minute of water. They have a number of lines now laid out to the pit area. The fire is out, but what they are doing now is trying to cool these fuel tanks. They picked up tremendous heat during that fire, which probably spread 30 or 40 feet in either direction of Herm's pit. And now they have to try and cool those tanks down. You can see them just pouring water over the fuel tanks. Then they'll have to clean up the pit area. There is fire extinguisher powder all over the place as there is water. And then they will have to bring the field in and line them up. Here is the order that they will line them up in. Charlie? The standings officially through lap 29, Tom Sneba, Rutherford, Mosley, Bobby Unser, and then Mears. Now, we will be back to cover this story. We'll stay right on top of it, and of course, the conclusion of the race. This is Charlie Jones along with Paul Page, Gary Gerald, and Bruce Jenner. We're back at the Michigan 500, where after 29 laps, the race has been stopped. Red flag due to a fire in the pits of Herm Johnson that then spread over three or four pits. Several crew members have been injured. We will have a report for you on that as soon as we get it. And this is what happened. This was about five or seven minutes ago. And remember that this fuel, once it catches fire, you cannot see it. So it is very dangerous from that standpoint. You simply cannot see this fuel when it is burning. That's the thing that everybody worries about on an alcohol fire. It's not visible. It can be very dangerous because it's not. These crewmen run back and forth while they're on fire. Could possibly set fire to something else. All right, now let's go down to Gary Gerald. Gary? Uh, obviously very hectic down here at the infield track hospital. At the track hospital, a tremendous amount of activity. Mike Knight has been checking on injuries. Mike, can you give us an update here in the early minutes? Yes, driver Herm Johnson has minor facial burns. He's being treated in the track hospital right now. One of his crew members, Greg Nelson, is being treated for first and second degree burns of the feet. A member of the Penske pit crew has been in with a lacerated leg. He's been released. Steve Edwards, the director of safety, received some burns to his feet. He's being treated right now. There are a few more people who are going to be brought in, but they are all injuries of a minor nature, minor burdens, and people who are going to receive some oxygen. Okay, Michael, thank you very much. We appreciate the cooperation on this, and we would update the fact that three support sand standby fire departments have responded after the call from the infield safety crew here. They were pouring 4,000 gallons a minute of water on the uh, tanks in an effort to cool them. There was, we could see, a lot of devastation of pit equipment, but certainly this first report is very encouraging at this time and Mike as we're standing here we're wondering do you have any indication if this race will be restarted it will be the technical crew of part is already in the process of making the preparations to restart the race as soon as the situation in the pits allows us to restart we will okay thank you very much let's go back upstairs now let's go back to what happened we had the fire in Herm Johnson's pit and this is what it looked like this is now 10 12 15 minutes ago when the fire broke loose and then it spread up and down. It got behind pit wall. That's where the tanks are, the fuel tanks are. We heard an explosion. We thought it was a fuel tank. We believe now that it was tires that were exploding. And because of the heat, the tanks that were caught into the heat itself expanded. And we can show you that. You can see on the left, the tank that has expanded. And on the right, the tank that is the normal tank. I'm a little ahead of you. There it is. There it is. Now you can see the difference in the tank. Herm Johnson's tank on the left has, has literally just bulged in the front end. And on the right is the normal tank of Bobby Unzer's crew, though there is a concern here, Charlie. Bobby Unzer's tank was only about 20 feet away. There, again, is the replay of fighting the fire. And as I watched the replay for a third time, I noticed what appeared to me to explode was the hose that connects the tank to the race car. Fortunately, again, there's a shutoff valve before the tank so that the fire couldn't actually get up into the tank. But look at this tremendous firefighting effort. This has been something that everyone has worried about in IndyCar racing for so long. Rick Mears had his fire at Indianapolis. It was contained. People complained about the time. But look at this tank. You can see the hose is gone. So, Charlie, I think that's what blew off. So we are under the red flag here. The race has been stopped. 
Twenty nine laps have been completed. Michigan 500 a total of 250 laps. The race the official word from the cart officials is that the race will be restarted. But of course first we've got to clear out the pits. We've got to get everything as back to possible as it was. Michigan 500 under the red flag will stay on top of the story. The standings Tom Sneva leading at this point. We'll be back in a moment. We're back at the Michigan 500. Let's go back to the fire that we had a few minutes ago Paul. Well the fire started when the car was being refueled as we see it now it's burning fiercely now watch at the front of the tank the hose is on fire and then suddenly the hose burns through and it was the explosion that we heard there it happens and look at its spray and it is spraying fuel and and fired down into the pits now directly behind that point there is a cutoff valve apparently it worked because the fire did not appear to blossom after that it continued burning in about the same status now I was saying early at the end of Annapolis 500 they were concerned about this they were concerned about response they got that fire out there before it got over the pit wall this one went over the pit wall and that even creates more concerns Roger Rager Dick Simon and Bobby Unzer all have pits that were closely adjacent and were partially involved so what do those people do let's go down to Gary Gerald and find out well, Bobby Unser is standing by here now as they begin this massive cleanup operation in the pits. And, and Bobby, it, you're almost, everyone is almost a loss for words. And I think your first comment was, this has really been a tough year for racing. Well, what I meant was the tough year for fires and racing. I just, I, I can't give you answers for it all happening. I can't give you reasons for Indianapolis happening like it did. We're, we're really safer than we've ever been for fire. I, it's just we're in an era of having fire problems, and uh, thank God nobody's getting hurt too bad, but it's just it's beyond my words to explain it. I couldn't even give you a good explanation for this. I mean, it's a second time for poor Herm Johnson. He had a problem at Milwaukee, and then another problem today, and, and uh, lo and behold, at Milwaukee, he was just almost next door to our pit. Right. And then again here, he was right next door to us, and uh, I just don't know. It's, uh, it shouldn't happen. We shouldn't have these fires. We're plenty safe, but I guess we are having them. At this point now, they've said that you're going to re be restarting this race. It's got to be awful tough, I think, to, to get your mind back to racing, which is going to be coming up here in the next who knows how many minutes. No, no problems there. The, the drivers that, uh, that run this race are pros. That won't bother them. The things that bother is like my pit was right next to his, and I got a lot of things that are burned. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to be short some items. Right. And, but we'll borrow some and make shift, and, and uh, now it looks like we'll get by all right. But for a while, it looked like it was really desperate, like we were possibly even going to have to pull out of the race because lack of things to run with like tires like wheels appreciate your comments Bobby we'll let you get back to the crew right now we're going to switch to uh, Bruce Jenner Gary just a Gary just a few minutes ago this uh, pit was ready to service a race car and right now it's completely destroyed and with me is John Menard now John you were on the right front tire when it went up that's right I had do you know just, exactly what happened well I just stopped the car I looked up they were fueling the car I started back around to check the left front tire they pulled I saw Greg pull the hose back out of the car that fills the car the thing that automatically closes the fuel valve stuck and the fuel started going all over I knew it was going to happen and I started for the water pail that's in the pit and by the time I got to the water pail it was burning already I started back over the wall and threw it at the driver and at Greg and by that time the fire extinguisher started going off and it was just do you know the conditions any other pit crews um, as far as I know our crew chief Dan Cota has got a slight burn on one hand uh, Greg, the fellow that was doing the fueling's feet are fairly badly burned, and our driver, Herm, has got facial burns, and one other fellow's got the hair burned off his hand, but not seriously. But nobody's uh, seriously injured. Nobody's really seriously injured. Greg has the most serious injuries on his feet. The, uh, they were spraying the fire foam on his, on his chest and head, thinking that that was on fire, yeah, but his, and in his feet, he was burning, and uh, it was just unfortunate that nobody got to him right away otherwise I think he would have been yeah. not it's a second time for you guys that, that makes it difficult second time and we really didn't need get that. a little gun shy yes sir. I don't blame you all right let's go back up to Charlie all right thank you Bruce it was just uh, not quite an hour ago that the race started and one of uh, NBC summer season innovations is an onboard camera and Bill Alsop's uh, race car in car number seven he was in the inside of the third row and this is what the start looked like from a driver's view 
Uh, the green flag already beginning to fly now as he accelerates. You can see how fast the front row pulled away. That yellow car is Johnny Rutherford, and Sneva is right down in front of him. Directly in front is Poncho Carter. And he pulled the low line, allowing some of the traffic up high going into the first turn. I'm absolutely amazed at these pictures. Remember the camera is just about four inches off the ground, right down in the nose. Now here comes Mike Mosley by. Look what a tremendous job of driving he did. And look, too, how close they are. Mosley kicking up some dusties down so low. Also decides to drop in behind him. What kind of speeds were they doing early in the race here? Well, they were probably picking up to uh, about 195 miles an hour at this point because they're really coming up to full speed as they come across the line now. Tremendous little camera, just an incredible job. The total package weighs only 10 and a half pounds. The camera itself is only a pound and a half. And Arnie Reef and Bob McCurran and our technical people, Fred Hamelfarb, Chuck Reisner, Tony Dia, Bob Decker, Phil DeFeo have worked constantly for several weeks on just the pictures you're looking at, and they have done a fine job. Also qualified to give you an idea at 197 miles an hour. We're still under the red flag here. We will be back, of course, to keep this story covered. And we will also be back for the start of the race when it's restarted. Let's go back in time as we look now to the standings through 29 laps with Tom Sneva, Johnny Rutherford, Mosley, Bobby Unser, and Rick Mears, the top five. Larry Dixon had problems in turn two. Now, there have been a lot of problems in turn two, as Johnny Rutherford told us earlier in an interview. It is simply slick there. And then Pancho Carter lost it spinning low when he saw Dixon out in front of him. Now this brought out the yellow flag. So under the yellow, then Herm Johnson, amongst others, headed for the pits. And that set up what was to be the one thing that would involve everybody here over the next half an hour. That was the fire that started in Herm Johnson's pit. Well, the fire spread very, very rapidly. The refueling holes did not shut off when they disconnected it from the car. It sprayed fuel. Then we saw what you just saw, the tank hose let go and a tremendous fire in the pits. That was the sequence of events. Now, you will recall at the Indianapolis 500, Rick Mears was involved in a fire in his pit, and he's with Bruce Jenner. Bruce? Charlie, he certainly was. And Rick... What goes through the minds of those guys when all of a sudden all they feel is that tremendous amount of heat? Well, it's uh, it's really hard to say. You know, when I had mine in Indianapolis, uh, I was more or less in a panic. I didn't know what to do. It when when that starts burning like that, you're just at a loss. You don't know what to do next, where to go, or or who to turn to. And uh, I, I was just a few pits away, and let me tell you, I was scared. All of a yeah. sudden, you didn't know what was going to happen, and you could see the you couldn't you could just see heat waves. You couldn't see flames. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a scary feeling. There's just not a whole lot you can do. A couple of the guys were just injured. Doesn't seem like too bad at this point. Uh, your injury seemed to be okay. You seem to be yeah. getting right back out there. It's getting better. It's getting better. We've still got a little more work to do on the nose, but it's coming around. It'll be all right by next year. All right, let's go to Gary Gerald. He's with Roger Penske. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Roger Penske overseeing the cleanup operation here in his pit. Roger, are you going to have to move your pit area? Well, I don't think so. Uh, fortunately, uh, we didn't have any fire here. The fire people jumped in and kept our, our area from uh, burning. We had some of our rubber hoses burned. We're going to change the fuel hose that goes into the car because it got the white powder on it. But all in all, we're in good shape, and we're just glad that nobody got hurt any worse than they did, and I uh, appreciate all the help everybody's given us. Any indication at this point of how far we are away from the restart? Of this race. Well, we should be able to start pretty quick. They're just cleaning up the pit lane here, and we're getting set. I think we'll go very shortly. Okay, Roger Penske overseeing the cleanup operation in the Bobby Unser pit right now. It's a massive effort down here, a tremendous amount of cooperation on all counts, a big job, and as Roger said, we're fortunate, I believe, that not more people were more seriously injured. All right, thank you, Gary. We are under the red flag here. Out of the race, Whittington is out, John Cock is out. However, we do have a report that because of the red flag that they are taking the John Cock car in, they're going to work on it, they're going to try and get it back out. Engelhardt is out with an accident, Herm Johnson is out with the fire. We, of course, will be updating this story throughout the afternoon. We will stay here for the race, the Michigan 500, when it is restarted. We're back at the Michigan 500. The race is still halted. However, the report is that we will have the restart of the race very soon. Of course, it has been stopped due to the fire in Herm Johnson's pit. This is a refueler's mask, and so you can see the damage that was done, and you can also see the fact that he had that protection. 
and that is because of the fires that we have been having this year. All right, we'll be back for the start here of the Michigan 500 when they're ready, but right now, let's go back to Mike Adamley and Donna Devarona for the women's survival of the fittest. Let me make a correction tomorrow. That will be same day satellite coverage as Prince Charles takes the field in that key international polo match just a few days before his wedding that uh, that uh, the prince dies. The princess is not that thrilled about the whole thing. All right. We are just a few minutes away from the restart here. The Michigan 500. There's been a delay for the refilling of the fire bottle. So let's take a look now as you can see the standings as they are changing. Uh, we understand that 32 cars out of the original 37 will be restarting here. We have been red flagged after a total of 29 laps. And that, of course, as you know by now, is due to the fire that we had here that uh, fortunately uh, no one was seriously injured. Uh, and we will be updating those reports on you. Now let's go back to the start of the race. Mike Mosley, who started in the 12th position, that's outside in row four, really charged in the first part of the race, Paul. Well, Mosley's stock block engine should pay off in torque, the ability to accelerate. Here is Mosley starting in 12th position. And as you can see, the torque working very well as he moves around Bill Alsop's car and really begins to fly. And he was able to move up in this first lap substantially. Look at the traffic and watch the fine job of driving that Mosley does as he darts down to the inside and is looking for just the right hole right behind Poncho Carter there. He falls in. A.J. Foyt is sitting up there and it's just a tremendous job as he keeps that car very low picks up another couple of positions and drops in behind A.J. Foyt. So Mosley who is exceedingly good in traffic and there you see it in the first lap of the race. He started 12 and in the first uh, first lap was able to pick up at least four positions. Mike Mosley at age 34 a total of five championship car wins including one this year at Milwaukee in car number 48 and this is his 15th year of driving championship cars so that means that he started at age 19 so he uh, joins that category of Pauls of the young titans now we are still of course under the red flag here the fire that we had earlier and that was in the pit of Herm Johnson and who needs baseball <laughs> right now we could use it but this is the fire and you have uh, an update on the re uh, an injury report Paul. Well it certainly had a potential to be in disaster you saw there the fire hose the uh, the fuel hose completely blow off the front here is the report of injuries Herm Johnson the driver suffered minor fascia burns treated and released from the first aid station here Greg Nelson a crew member first and second degree burns of the feet was taken to the University of Michigan burn center in Ann Arbor Harbor, just a, about 25 miles from here. Jay Signori, a crew member on the Penske team and one of his executives, was cut on the left leg and taken to Foot East Hospital in Jackson for treatment. Then Steve Edwards, who is the director of safety for CART, suffered some burns of the feet. He was treated and released from the first aid station here at the track. Dan Cotta, Johnson's crew chief, burned on the right hand, treated and released at the first aid station here at the track. And Nick Sargent, Orville Huff, and Dale Wampler, all MIS firemen, were treated and then released for inhalation of smoke and vapors. And of course, what you saw with the fire, that was a replay. It has been brought under control. A few days ago, we had a chance to see exactly how the safety crew works. The reaction starts when the accident happens. Yellow, yellow, yellow. Car against the outside rail in turn three. Yellow, yellow, yellow. We have a car in the wall in turn three. Car one is in the wall. There is definite contact. At no time in championship racing are seconds more precious than when a serious crash occurs. In this simulation for our Sports World cameras, we've just seen how quickly the elaborate firefighting gear stationed around the track can snuff out the dreaded threat of fire. But stifling the flames is just the first step of the rescue process. Efforts must then be made to stabilize the driver, then begin the process of extrication. If the situation demands, the Hearst Jaws of Life, augmented by special cutting tools, is pressed into operation. In this demonstration, we can see how effectively CART Safety Director Steve Edwards is able to cut through steel posts at the same time a jammed door is being forced open by the sophisticated extrication equipment. 
Should the need arise, each of the two cart safety vehicles is equipped with water gel fire blankets that can be used to wrap a burn victim. The sterile blankets provide a cooling effect for the victim as he awaits transportation to a burn center. Aiding Edwards is medical director Dr. Steve Olvik, who tends to the driver's need while Edwards supervises the extrication. A medical doctor rides with the fire crews and rescuers in each of the cart emergency vehicles. Both doctors have extensive medical equipment at hand, including cardiac monitor and defibrillator, IVs, resuscitation equipment, and specially designed backboards to fit Indy cars. They are, in effect, a totally self-sustained emergency unit, the type of unit necessary for this style of racing, but a unit all hope will not be needed in the course of today's event. And Steve Edwards, the principal character in that dramatization, the fellow in the orange suit, is the director of safety for CART, and he was one of those that suffered some injury, some burns on the feet in the pit fire. Uh, you can see uh, this should be a treatment of Edwards here in replay, where they are found out, apparently somewhat belatedly, because the alcohol fire doesn't become visible then apparently they were able to get it out just by dumping water on it. Gary Gerald at this moment is with Steve Edwards. Gary? Paul, it's somewhat ironic that we do a feature piece prior to this race. Steve Edwards kind enough to show us the various skills in that tremendous blaze of approximately an hour ago. He was in the middle of the firefighting operation, as you indicated, a slight burn. Steve, uh, we're pleased to see you here, but I know you're trying to get geared back up to go out and racing, and that seems to be foremost in your mind right now. That's the number one thing. They tried to keep me in the hospital, but I told them no way, so I bolted for the door, and here I am. It takes a tremendous amount of dedication. I don't know if you, can you put it in words what it takes to be in the middle of a potentially dangerous situation is what we saw earlier this afternoon. You just got to love racing and you, these competitors are my friends and I want to do what I can for them and that's really the bottom line. Well, you've said it very beautifully. We're glad to see that you're all right and I know there's a lot of work yet to be done. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you and I just like my family to know I am okay, so don't worry. All right, that's Steve Edwards, the director of safety for championship auto racing teams. He's back into action. Let's go back to Charlie Jones and Paul Page. Auto racing takes all kinds of forms, and so does Paul Newman's participation in it. Today, he is here not as a driver, but an owner, watching his drivers, Al Unzer and Tio Fabi, compete in the 1981 Can-Am Challenge. Yeah. Paul, can we get you This team this year, Al Unzer, Tio, is it doing what you want to do in Can-Am racing? You betcha. What are your ultimate goals? What would you like Paul Newman to have done in racing when it's all over? I don't know that I've thought that far ahead. I mean, racing is something, at least that I do, year by year. I don't know about Al. He's a young whippersnapper. But us older guys, you know, it's day by day. Newman started racing at age 47 after starring in the movie Winning. He won two National Sports Car Club of America championships and finished second in the 1979 24 Hours of Le Mans. Now, at 56, Newman continues to race Datsuns in both amateur and professional divisions. This is his fourth year as a Can-Am owner as well, and his first year with three-time Indy winner Al Unzer as one of his team drivers. He's, a, he's really a, a great guy because he, he, I don't look at him as a, in the status that he is what he is. I look at him as a, as a car owner that is very much interested in, in putting together a fantastic team, and he wants to win. And, and it's not a pastime. It's not something that he just says, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, well, they do that on the weekend. He comes and actually wants to know what is going on and why this isn't done or that isn't done. So uh, I love it. I, I think every car owner should uh, participate as strong as, as he is. Uh, so far, I, I can't say enough about him, and that's not because he is who he is. I could care less about that uh, as an individual, is what I'm talking about. Well, I think he's a very fast racing driver, and uh, because he knows very well the car, it's uh, very easy to, to work for him. Because when, when you're talking about the car with him, it's, uh, he knows what uh, you're talking about. Well, I started racing very late, and I knew it was late, and I thought, well, there will come a point where I'll get older and slower. 
And I thought that would have been about four years ago. <laughs> and to kind of protect myself, because I really did want to stay in racing, I wanted to have a team, and I like hand am racing. I think it's, uh, I think the cars are exotic. I like road racing rather than, uh, than any other kind. And uh, I don't know. I, I'm not getting older and slower, so I'm still racing. And it's difficult because uh, I do a lot of flying, I'll tell you. Back and forth between mine and, and, and Can-Am racing, it's difficult. You're quoted as not having come to the Can-Am because these cars are over your head. Is that quote accurate? Do you really feel that way? Yeah, that's accurate. I'd just be out there looking for an accident. The driver has an uh, injured leg. He's out of the car. There is no fire. The Canadian American Challenge, the Can-Am, once featured the most powerful road racing cars in the world. Political infighting destroyed the Can-Am in 1974, but the series was resurrected in 1977. The cars are prototype sports cars, much like Indy cars, but with fenders and top speeds of 190 miles an hour. With the participation of interested sponsors and owners like Paul Newman, it is becoming the top form of American road racing again. I wish there was a hundred people like him involved in racing ball, and I mean this because uh, he's a good car owner. He, he puts a lot of effort towards the team, and uh, when you when you have a car owner like that, that it means nothing but a hundred percent. It's very important to to have uh, Paul Newman on the team because uh, he's, uh, he's a very famous person. So I think for him, it's uh, more easy to get uh, the sponsor. When you looked at it at first and thought this would be fun, has it been as much fun as you thought it'd be? More. Oh yeah, it's a real kick in the rear. The results of the 1981 Can-Am Challenge at Watkins Glen were not favorable to Paul Newman's team. Both Al Unser and Teo Fabi had car trouble, so Newman's team did not win. We're still awaiting the restart at Michigan 500. We'll be back in a moment. We're back at the Michigan 500 officially five minutes to the restart. Now, what we have seen in the pits thus far today, in reality, has been pandemonium, but it's not that way normally. This is where you see the crews at work, and it is programmed. Gary Gerald has a report on a pit stop. It may be a well-worn racing cliche, but without a doubt, races are won and lost in the pits. During the course of today's Michigan 500, this scene will be repeated more than a half dozen times by the hardworking crews serving each of the drivers. A precisely choreographed piece of business that occurs when five men come over the wall to change tires and add upwards of 40 gallons of fuel in a matter of seconds. This is the Rick Mears pit crew in action, the same crew that was ravaged by fire this year at Indianapolis. This special demonstration for our Sports World cameras reunited the Mears team for the first time since that horrifying experience at Indy. Let's look at the specific functions of each crew member as Mears Gould Charge is serviced. First, Airjacker Chuck Sprague connects an air hose that instantly elevates the car on four jacks. At the same time, John Haup wields an impact wrench to remove and replace the right rear wheel. As the car comes down off the jacks, both men race to the rear to help push mirrors away. At the right front location, Chief Mechanic Peter Perry handles another high-speed wheel gun to change the right front tire. As he pirouettes away from the wheel back to the wall, Parrott must be absolutely certain the hose is clear of the car. Meanwhile, Mark Wisniewski and Bill Murphy work in tandem to fuel the car. Wisniewski vents the top of the fuel tank as Murphy couples the fuel hose to the side of the tank. When fuel appears in the vent hose, both men simultaneously pull their hoses and jump back. In a matter of seconds, the team concept of championship racing is put to the supreme test in a well-orchestrated series of maneuvers that sends Rick Mears back on the track. We have been under the red flag now for about an hour and 25 minutes. 
Early on the red flag caused by the fire in the pits, an interview with Johnny Rutherford, Paul Page, he said that he felt there ought to be an inquiry. From your experience, what can they do to increase the safety, the problem of the fires? Well, Charlie, one point to be made. We certainly have now been warned, third time this year, a fire in the pits, this one the most serious of the three. Uh, they have all involved injury. Johnny Rutherford offered earlier in the year that one thing that could be done is some sort of additive put in the methanol alcohol fuel so that the fire could be seen, so that you knew where it was burning, and to help the firefighters fight it. Uh, there have been constant arguments about what to do with these fuel tanks. There's about 280 gallons of fuel available for a race per tank. They are in really just steel containers that are sitting up on pipes. And how would you fight a fire in that situation? Interestingly enough, Johnny Rutherford's own crew did some extra purchasing and now have little bottles of special chemical that if a fire would start in the pits, they can turn them on and hopefully it would help suppress it. Anything that they do to help suppress fire in the pits is going to be expensive, and that's the problem they're faced with. I'm wondering if maybe one of the first solution is to make the fuel tanks in the pits have the same criteria as the fuel tank in the race car. That is a completely crash-worthy sealed system, but that, that's only one possibility. I do think Johnny Rutherford is correct. Let's take a look at it. We've had three warnings. Let's find out what we can do to correct it. All right, now let's go back to the restart that we will be having here in a few moments. When they restart, it will be as they were stopped, because they were stopped on the track. They were stopped under the red, so they were stopped immediately. So you will see coming out behind the pace car, Tony Bittenhauser, Bob Lazier, and Salt Walter. They are not amongst the leaders. These will be the leaders. In the fourth car will be Tom Sneva, followed by Johnny Rutherford, Mike Mosley, Bobby Unser, Vern Chupin. Now, the cars have really set their position in the race now, so when we come to a restart single file, these cars will probably maintain their relative positions as they run down through the field. There is some mild confusion because of the confusion around the red flag. There was so much fire extinguisher smoke in the air and everything that perhaps some of the scorers were not able to see the exact positions. And so part of the problem is to try and reestablish the field exactly as it was. One thing that has been said without question is when they come around the first time, the first of those yellow flag laps, they will start counting with lap number 30. Now that is lap 30 of a 250 lap race. So still a lot left to go. Bobby Unzer has to be thinking about a number of very important items. Remember his pit is directly adjacent to Herm Johnson's, the one where the fire was centered. Now some of his equipment got very, very hot. They took his tires and his wheels back to the garage area to have them as fully inspected, but nobody is entirely sure when it when something like that happens what the effect of heat on some of this equipment is. So they have done the best they can in inspection, but I guess there is always going to be a question until they can actually actually examine it with uh, with special testing equipment how safe all of that equipment is. It is as safe as they can make it at the time, but there is a question mark there. All right, is there another driver besides Bobby Unser that is facing that same problem? Well, certainly Dick Simon has to be looking at the same situation. He was on the other side of the Unser pits at the time, and they looked at his wheels and tires as well. Uh, you also don't know, we heard them say in the, in the Bobby Unser pits that their hoses were damaged. They had to replace them. So there's, there's a lot of things that have to be answered there. Let's go down to Gary Gerald, who's with Mike Mosley. Paul, we're right down here alongside the Pepsi Challenger and Mike Mosley, who has just now buckled back in. Mike, any problems at all with this long delay in your mind and getting back now into the real racer syndrome? No, I don't think I'll have much problem, no. Obviously, you have made great strides in this past week. You qualified at one speed. The next day, you gained a couple of miles per hour in practice. You gained more in yesterday's practice session. What has happened with this team to see this dramatic gain in speed? Well, as you probably know, it's, this car is basically pretty new, and we keep learning every time we run it. And we try to make a lot of changes, and we've just, the car has come good for us. It's got to be a tremendously exhilarating feeling for you to know that you're making that progress and up until the red flag challenging for a lead. Uh, most definitely. It's nice to be competitive. All right, Mike Mosley, he's set. He's ready to go down here in car number 48. Let's go to Bruce Jenner. Right now I'm with Tom Sneva. And Tom, they put you back a few places, although you were leading at the time. Well, I'm not sure what there's some confusion on the scoring. Uh, some of these guys feel they should either be able to pack up behind us or, or whatever. but. Uh, you know, this is part of the deal. It's still early, and we've got a long ways to go. Certainly do, and your car is running very well. 
we're happy with it. If it'll just uh, keep running like it has been, we'll be in good shape. <laughs> okay, good luck to you. Thank you. Charlie? All right, Bruce, something that you might notice, Mike Mosley and Tom Sneva both wearing glasses. Under the rules, you are not allowed to wear contact lens when you drive in a kart race. Well, that's a pretty straightforward situation. If you would have something go wrong with your contact lens, a little particle of dirt or dust under it, or if it would blow off your eye, then you're in real trouble. So contact lenses have not been allowed in any form of racing. And I'd like to mention, I've mentioned this story before on Tom Steva, but he says that when he goes to the driver's meeting, he's got an extra thick pair of glasses that he wears to the driver's meeting so he can worry the other drivers. And kind of reinforce everybody. Bobby Unzer is in his machine and ready. It looks like they're getting very close to the start of this race. A restart, actually, after a very long red flag. And something that we might watch for, they will run, as we have been told, then four laps under the yellow. Those laps will count. Several cars did not come in under the yellow before the red. They can then come in under this yellow of the four laps. They can pick up their fuel and tires if they need it and then go back out. So that'll be interesting to see who makes that particular move. They have just changed the scoring lineup. They are now going to start the cars, they say, in order, which means that Tom Sneva will be at the head of the serial behind the pace car. All right. So we are awaiting the restart of the Michigan 500, a total of 250 laps. We have 29 laps complete. We'll be back with more of the Michigan 500 in just a moment. We're back at the Michigan 500. In case you joined us late, let us update on what has taken place. The race started, we had a couple of yellows, then we had a yellow that immediately went to a red when a fire broke out in Herm Johnson's pit. And we have had a delay running now almost an hour and a half so they could clean out all the pits, they could get set for the restart. Well, they've indicated to us that what's going to happen here, they actually have Tony Bettenhausen in the front of the line, followed by Bob Lazier and Salt Walter. As soon as they pull clear of the pits, those three cars will drop back. That will put Tom Sneva in the lead of the serial. He is at the lead of the race at this moment. They have most of the crews have pushed their cars into proper position. They're ready to get going once again. It's a moment for a crew chief as well as a driver of, of wondering. These cars have cooled down now for a long time, over an hour, and they're a little bit worried about engine temperatures. And so they want to start these cars very carefully. That's one of the reasons for the yellow laps. All right, and they will run four laps under the yellow, but now let's go back to almost an hour and a half ago to see what caused the delay, the near tragedy in the pits of Herm Johnson. Well, Herm Johnson brought his machine in for refueling. When they pulled the hose out, the fuel continued to spray and immediately ignited. What you are seeing is the fire extinguisher powder that was being dumped on that fire. They brought almost all of the fire apparatus on the grounds to this point on the racetrack in the pits and in fact dropped over 800 pounds of powder on the complete fire area. And there's Herm Johnson. He's climbed out of the car. You can see his refueler jumping about. They dump water on Herm Johnson, which works for a small alcohol fire. His refueler reacting to the burns that he's receiving. Johnson is all right. His refueler is still smarting from his burns, and they're continuing to spray him with powder. This all being done in replay, of course. This happened an hour and a half ago and was the reason for stopping this race. Now, while this is going on, there was a continuing fire at the fuel tank, and it burned for some time. And we now have the restart of the race as the base car is pulling out. At the IndyCar race is pulling out behind them, as we mentioned. Tony Bittenhausen, Bob Lazier, and Saul Waller, the first three, then followed by the order of the race. And they will, as they come through turn two, be dropping back and picking up their proper position. So the restart here, under the yellow, we will be running four laps under the yellow before the start. And the first lap as they come around, because on the red, they stopped immediately on the track, right where you were. And that will be, as they come through the first lap under the yellow, will be the 30th lap of this 250 lap race. This is a two mile oval here at Michigan International Speedway. The turns here are banked at 18 degrees. The back straight is, is almost flat. It has a five degree bank. The front straight, although it looks flat, in reality is not. It has a 12 degree bank along the front straight. You can see them pull up on the bank right now. Uh, there is one other point. As you saw the cars pull out, Larry Dixon, and Poncho Carter both 
were able to move back into the field. They were involved in spins. Dixon actually touching the wall that caused the yellow that started the red, but they are both back in the field. Here's a correction. Rick Mears is currently fifth, so it is Tom Sneva, Johnny Rutherford, Mike Mosley, Bobby Unser, and Rick Mears. We are under the yellow now, but we have the restart underway at the Michigan 500. So we will be back with more racing in just a moment. We are still, of course, under the yellow with about two and a quarter laps to go before we'll have the green. 32 cars in the restart. Herm Johnson, Cliff Hussle, Billy Englehart, Gordon Johncock, and Bill Whittington, the five cars that are out of the race from the original field of 37. Yellow flag is out. It will remain out. Your leader is Tom Sneva. Johnny Rutherford is right behind him. This is a very important series of laps for them under the yellow. They want to get a good look at the race course, especially in the first and second turns. The cause of Larry Dixon's spin was apparently an oiling down that was done by Bill Kaliba's car. They have put oil dry out on the track to try and dry it up. But until the race cars actually come over at its speed a bit, they're not going to know too much about it. So they really want to examine that turn. There's some oil dry all up and down the first turn, and the cars are running through it. Hopefully they'll blow a bit of it off before they come back to speed. But that is a concern for them. Well, what kind of a situation, something that we have a moment uh, here before we do get the green flag. What do what do we have from a driver's standpoint, from a car standpoint, a 500 mile race against basically a track that is banked all the way around rather than a flat track like at Indianapolis? Well, the greatest problem is potential fatigue. The centrifugal force is causing lateral G loading. In other words, very simply, he's just being pushed to the right in the cockpit. He's being forced over by the centrifugal force. That's very fatiguing. They wear collars around their necks. They wear little straps connected from their helmet to their shoulders to try and keep their head upright but with the helmet on there and the extra weight of the helmet and the, uh, the G loading that they're receiving. They're just being pushed over constantly and that contributes to fatigue. So they're trying to relax as best they can. A delay of uh, close to an hour and 35 minutes will simply add to that fatigue factor, I would think, mental as well as physical. Well, on the other hand, they did have this time to relax, so I don't know how much relaxation they got. This has certainly been some tense moments for them, and it's been a matter of great concern. Are their friends injured? What's happened? What will happen to me? So I don't think they got that much relaxation. It probably did, in fact, add to their fatigue. We are still under the yellow at the Michigan 500. We now have officially 31 laps complete. Four laps of the yellow before we'll have the green, as we mentioned. Several of the cars have begun using a technique of serpentining back and forth. Jose Lee Garza was doing it just a moment ago. What they are concerned about there, though Tom Sneve and Johnny Rutherford don't seem too concerned about it, is to try and wear their tires back up to the operating temperature just above 210 degrees so they'll stick well when they come back to the start. You see several of the cars actually doing that. Now, Car number 57, Cliff Husel, has brought his machine into the pits. Apparently something wrong on his car. They're looking in the engine compartment. We have a report that uh, it is leaking oil, so they're taking a look at that. The weather a lot different than it was a week ago where we had the postponement due to the rain. Uh, we started with a hazy, cloudy day and the sun was shining, although uh, clouds have begun to move in on us right now. The forecast is that there would be rain, but it would be this evening. About 7 o'clock this evening was the official forecast that we had. Now still another couple of yellow laps will be run. The pace car is staying out. Again, they want to take a long look at the race course. And if Cliff Hussle was boiling, then they want to look at it even further and make sure he didn't add anything to it. We talked about what uh, G forces uh, might do which Paul Page was talking about and that is of course against in this particular track that is banked in reality all the way around. So we asked the drivers what uh, do G forces actually do to them. Well again uh, it feels like your head weighs a lot more than it usually does. Fortunately I've got a small head in the first place so it's not as bad as it might be on some of the other drivers but uh, you know it just feels like all the parts and pieces weigh a lot more than they naturally weigh and, uh, and you're trying to fling it out the side of the car so uh, it becomes a little job to focus the eyeballs and uh, to hang on and you just hope that uh, nothing breaks because you're leaning on the right side of the car awfully hard. There's Tom Sneva adding to exactly what you were talking about Paul. 
on a flat track like Indianapolis, you still have a certain amount of G-force. They just don't pull as much as, as they do again in a bank track. Is that yeah, correct? It's certainly not like uh, the forces that you're feeling at a track like this. The pace car has begun to speed up, and Charlie, it looks like we're going back to green at lap 34. It'll be Tom Sneva, Johnny Rutherford, Mike Mosley, Bobby Unser, Rick Mears, the top five, then followed by Steve Krisiloff, Al Unser, Osele Garza, Tom Bigelow, Gary Bettenhauser, Dick Simon. And they begin to pick up the revs and speed now. The pace car is coming off, and Tom Sneva is leading them back to the green flag. And the green flag is waving, and here comes Sneva, Rutherford, Mosley. Unser. So Sneva continues to run all over the race course. He can, at this point in time, do almost anything that he wants to as he holds the lead over Johnny Rutherford. Rutherford has opened the lead over Mosley in third, and in fourth is Bobby Unser, and those four have separated themselves from the other race car. Tom Sneva's got to be happy with that car. It's running so very well, he can literally drive it anywhere he wants. Coming through three and headed for turn four, and Mosley makes his move as he comes underneath. Mosley closing on Johnny Rutherford. Right back up on the back end of Rutherford's machine. Mosley coming across the line down low. He's challenging Johnny Rutherford for second place, and Mosley pushes his nose past, though can he hold on to it all the way through the turn? He and Rutherford are equal and side by side through the second turn. Now, Mosley forges his way ahead and moves into second place and begins now a challenge of the leader, Tom Sneva. And so the outstanding driver so far has been Mike Mosley. He started back in the 12th position. He's back in second where he has been before. Tom Sneva leads. And now coming into turn four, Mosley is underneath Sneva. He's got position on him as he heads down the front straight. It is Sneva and Mosley. Mosley challenging underneath Sneva. Sneva holds him off as they go into turn one. And then a challenge to Rutherford by Bobby Unser. So first and second place, both being hotly contested here. Here is Mike Mosley alongside Tom Sneva. You can see Bobby Unser challenging Johnny Rutherford. They're on the backstretch, and the tremendous power of Mike Mosley's stock block engine is paying off right now. Though Sneva now beginning to pull just a bit ahead, and he takes the turn ahead of Mike Mosley. So Sneva maintains the lead. He had the lead coming across the line, will be scored as the leader on the last lap. But Mosley is not giving up. He's continuing to battle. So Mosley again challenges underneath. Unser challenges Rutherford underneath. But neither can take. So it is Sneva. Mosley, Rutherford, and Bobby Unser, the top four. Mike Mosley is operating so low on the race course. It's a good place to run on a high bank. If he can hold on to a tight, he can come off the corner a little bit better. There he's done it, but it seems that Tom Sneva's motor picks up revs at the end of the straightaway and he forges ahead as he's doing now. Tom Sneva holds off the challenge of Mike Mosley. We have 37 laps complete. We're coming to lap number 38. And Mosley underneath Sneva, and he takes him out of turn four. So it is Mosley in front of Sneva. Sneva again at the end of the front straight, going high with the extra power that Paul was talking about. He stays side by side as they go for turn two, and Sneva has the lead again. Rutherford is running third. Bobby Unser is running fourth. What a fine battle for first place as Mosley came off the line just a nose ahead of Sneva. Two fantastic racing drivers as they're battling around the two miles bank at Michigan International Speedway. Here's the battle for second place. Johnny Rutherford and Bobby Unser. Rutherford has been able to hold Unser back, but now Unser just screams past Rutherford. And the question is, is Rutherford slowing? It is Sneva, Mosley, Unser, and Rutherford, the top four. Again, they are separated from the other cars as they go through turn one and head for turn two. But Sneva, as you said, has to be tremendously pleased with the way that that machine is operating. A new car this year. Going around this racetrack like it's on rails. It is not that old a car. It was built to George Bignani's specification, who is there is a car coming in now into the pits. Car 45 is uh, Harry McDonald, apparently a flat tire. They'll change in rapidly. Talking again about Tom Sneva's car and their chief mechanic, George Bignati, the winningest mechanic in all of IndyCar racing. 
told the March company what he wanted out of the car. They built it for him, and they delivered it, and immediately it was a very, very fast machine. It's, it's barely three months old, and look at it. Leading this race, though Mike Mosley is certainly giving it a run for its money. 40 laps complete down the back straight side by side. It is Mosley on the inside. Schneeba again with the extra acceleration at the end of the straight to hold the lead into the turns. Now they run into lap traffic. Sneva will go high. He has the door closed on him. Mosley comes underneath, uses the lap traffic, and he takes the lead. Mike Mosley takes the lead. So Mike Mosley just splits up and goes around, and Tom Sneva has to drop in behind. I wonder if what Johnny Rutherford hasn't been thinking through all of this is, why should I run so hard so early? And maybe he's satisfied just to stay in close contact with the leaders. And earlier, we asked Mike Mosley if he exercised to prepare for this 500-mile race. No. No, I haven't. Here's no, we just, we just try to make the car as comfortable as possible for me so that I don't get tired as far as handling and so on. If you have to fight the car all day long, you're never going to survive. So you got to have a, a, a well-handling car to run all day, to run fast all day. An important point, the comfort of the car. The well, seats it, are molded to the bodies of the drivers. It's very hard to really be truly comfortable in one of these machines. Let's take a look at this battle for third. Johnny Rutherford is leading Bobby Unzer once again. So apparently Rutherford decided maybe it's not so good an idea to let Bobby roll past me and I'm going to get back into this competition. Now they have dropped back as a pair about 300 yards behind Tom Sneva, who's now in second. Mike Mosley is the leader and he's opened up a comfortable margin over Tom Sneva once they got in the lap trap and he was able to move around. Now a question of dependability of the We've been calling it stock block, which is really a misnomer. It's a push rod engine. Most of the components in it are really designed for racing, though the basic design of it is a stock block engine. And the question is, how dependable will it be? How long can it continue to do what it's doing now, which is leading this 500? The strength of the stock block engine. The strength, we'll talk about that in just a moment as we continue with our coverage of the Michigan 500. We'll be back in just a moment. We're back live at the Michigan 500 where Pancho Carter in car number five has begun to move back up through the field. Now he was the fourth fastest qualifier, but then when one car oiled down the track, both he and Larry Dixon spun. Pancho was able to get the car restarted, moved up to 19th position immediately thereafter, but he has been flying on this racetrack. Moments ago, he unlapped himself from A.J. Foyt, who was running eighth at the time, and Pancho is trying to get back into the fight now. And there's Pancho Carter. Now let's go back to the battle between Johnny Rutherford in third and Bobby Unser in fourth. As Rutherford now holding that margin over Bobby Unser. Unser took over third, then Rutherford took right back just about a lap later. And Johnny has held on to the number three position as Mike Mosley continues to lead and Tom Sneva continues to run second. Mike Mosley's car has been running very well. We've talked a lot about its engine, but I think we also have to talk about this new Eagle chassis with the smaller rear wing. I think that that chassis is adding to his ability to race here because he's driving the car anywhere he wants to, high or low on the banking. So the combination of engine, the car, and certainly Mike Mosley are paying off for Dan Gurney and his team here today. But let's go back to the strength of that particular engine, the strength is power in the turns. Is that correct? Well, it is on most racetracks. The fact that it has more torque, more ability to accelerate. But on a high bank like this, several of the drivers told me that they are only wavering about 200 RPMs between their fastest and their slowest engine speed. And there is Jerry Carl. Carl, one of the chargers, and we expect to see him move up throughout the afternoon. Gary Carl with his stock clock machine is uh, one of the cars that, that does not have the financial support that so many people do. And earlier we had an opportunity to uh, analyze a rich team and a poor team. A real story is developing back in second place because Jerry Carl in the red and white number 38 
in a machine powered by a standard American Chevrolet stock block engine is doing battle with the former world driving champion Mario Andretti in a highly sophisticated Cosworth power machine. Back at the Phoenix 150, that tremendous battle for second place has just ended in an oily cloud of disappointment for Jerry Carl as his engine has let go. A richly deserved standing ovation from the fans here in Phoenix for Jerry Carl. A tremendous fight. He kept that stock block engine running. Gotta be a happy guy. Auto racing is very expensive. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to operate a team for a year. And in these days of double-digit inflation, the problem of racing may be a rich team versus a small team. The question is, how can the small team compete? Take, for example, Jerry Carl versus Roger Penske. Roger Penske's race cars go to the racetrack in style in this large truck. Now, it doesn't just carry the cars. Inside, there is a complete machine shop, and it also serves as the base station for the race car's two-way radio communication. When the Penske racing team goes to a racetrack, they bring along a large entourage. There are three cars, three drivers, they have a backup car, and a crew of over 30 mechanics. Along with that, they have enough spare parts to build up yet another race car, should it be necessary. Jerry Carl's truck doesn't have the fresh new paint job or the bright glittering chrome that Roger Penske's does, and inside, there's not nearly the sophisticated equipment either. Jerry Carl, unlike Roger Penske's drivers, has to work on the race car himself. His full-time help consists of two extra people. He picks up some other fellows that come along on the weekend and help him race. He has one old race car and one backup motor. Some people have the idea you've got to have a couple million dollars to go IndyCar racing, and that's not true at all. Uh, you can do a real good job for a sponsor for somewhere in the area of a quarter of a million dollars a year if you use your head and, and uh, you have a cooperative bunch. You know, you, you, can, you can also be foolish and, and uh, throw a lot of money away, uh, waste a lot of money. Uh, we get along right now and a lot less than that. And, uh, of course, uh, we, we, these aren't new cars. We built these cars last year. They're, they're last year's equipment. And uh, uh, we've got four stock block engines that we've built for this season that we've been, we've been struggling uh, through with. Jerry Carl's financial struggles would ease if he had sponsorship. But sponsors are noticeably absent from his car. Carl has one cash sponsor, Tonko Trailers. They contribute about $50,000 to his racing effort. Carl's total budget for the year is approximately $250,000. His car costs about $35,000. One stock block engine, about $20,000. This year, Carl has won $46,456 in prize money. But the Roger Penske racing team has three major sponsors, A.B. Dick, Gould, okay. and Norton. Each contributes a minimum of $250,000 to $300,000 to Penske Racing. Lesser sponsors include Goodyear, Cam2, Craco, and Champion Spark Plugs. The total budget for Penske Racing this year is $2.3 million. Penske uses Cosworth engines, which cost $45,000 a piece, and this year has won $268,564. It's, it's kind of tough for us right now. We're our, we are short, and uh, we're trying to put together a, our budget for next year. And, uh, of course, the way the economy is today, it's kind of hard to find the, the money that you need to, to switch, either, either transform these cars to Cosworth engines or, or update to a, a later car and a Cosworth engine. You know, we almost won the race at, uh, at Phoenix. We had a chance at it. We were running second with 18 laps to go and broke. And, we were of course, we were catching Tom Sneva, who was the eventual winner. And uh, the people went crazy, and that's what people, the people want to see competition. Roger Penske had the same sponsors and had brand new cars and, and the Cosworth engines, and, and yet we were able to, uh, to outrun Mario Andretti for second place at Phoenix. And, and uh, that's racing. When, it, when a guy has a, if a, a crew is good enough and an engine builder is good enough and a driver is good enough to be able to do that. Of course, everyone who does drive has access to the big bucks it takes to race. Whether it's three mechanics or 30, a bright, shiny truck, or a faded old one. The beauty of this sport is that occasionally, the poor man's team wins. We are back live, and we are under the yellow. Salt Walter had a problem down the back straight. There is Jerry Carl, who is right behind the pace car. All of the leaders came in as a result of the yellow flag that came out 
when Salt Walther blew his engine, there's apparently oil on the track. We have several other cars beginning to show light blue smoke at the back that indicate that they are leaking something too. There is a machine on the back stretch that uh, Salt Walther, uh, there he is when he blew his engine. He put his hand in the air right away to say that he was slowing, but when he did that, of course, a lot of oil came out, Charlie. Jerry Carl behind the pace car, moving slowly under the yellow flag. We have officially 55 laps complete. This, this is a race of 250 laps, so we have 195 still to go. The Michigan 500, and uh, that's Dick Simon's car. There's smoke uh, coming out of there. He had problems in his pit stop just a few moments ago. Uh, he was showing uh, that billowing smoke then, and maybe it'll clean up when he gets back to acceleration. Now let's go down to Gary Gerald. We're alongside Salt Walther here in his pits. He just climbed out of the car very quickly, peeled off the long john, the flame proof it's underwear. Hot. It's hot out there, huh, Salt? Yeah, it's very hot. You got a 33 or 34 degree bank here, and it just pushes the driver. You got about a 3G force down in there. And we're in a double layer uniform along with a fireproof underwear. It's just, it's darn hot out there. Well, why are you here in the pits talking to us rather than out there in the racetrack? <laughs> I wish I knew. It looked like we, you know, we'd moved up into third or fourth place again, and the car just running beautifully, and uh, just let an engine just let go, but, uh, as they say, that's racing, so we just have to learn to accept it. I know you were running at uh, Pocono a few weeks back. This is your second time in this car, one of the March cars. Have you been pleased with the way the cars responded well, to you? This is not a March. This is the car that Tom missed the Indy 500 with, Tom Sneva, and then they, Dad and I worked a deal, so I'm driving for George McNaughty, but we hope to purchase the car. They did a lot of work on it and changed it since Indy. It didn't, didn't make the show, but it's a Phoenix car with March suspension. And at Pocono, we're right on the track record, so we were capable of winning that. So I'm, I'm very pleased with the performance of the car and the crew. Everybody's been great. It's just, you know, airplanes aren't supposed to crash, but they do. Race car engines break, too. What can you say? All right. Thank you very much. David Salt Walther, number 21, now out of the race. All right. Thank you, Gary. 56 laps officially completed. We are still under the yellow. We now have Rick Mears out in front. He is the current leader. Mike Mosley second, Johnny Rutherford third, Bobby Unser fourth, Steve Krisloff fifth, as we had several pit stops immediately after the yellow flag came out. And Tom Sneva, as a result of his stop, may have dropped back behind Steve Krisloff, but we're anticipating a green flag now. The green flag out and flying, showing first to Jerry Carl, but now our leader's coming down toward the line, and as the green flag comes out, several cars, including Dick Simon, who we mentioned earlier, is, have begun to smoke on the track. It looks like Simon's engine's done for the day. There's Mike Mosley as he makes his bid to get back in front once again. So Mike Mosley has been the story thus far in the early going of the Michigan 500. Mike, in his 15th year of driving champion championship cars, is a total of five wins, including the victory this year at Milwaukee, and he's 34 years of age. Mike Mosley, a fine young champion with years and years of Indy car experience behind him, and yet he has yet to win a 500-mile race. So he's out front now in a design that has not proven to be that successful so far, the stock block engine, but maybe he can make it work today. Rick Mears running second. Johnny Rutherford is running third. Now we're getting a change in some of the lineup. What we're actually looking at is a battle for second place. The white car, the light car, is Al Unzer, and he is leading Johnny Rutherford. Al currently being scored in second, Johnny Rutherford in third, and Al beginning to pull away just a little bit. You saw some puffs at the back of his car. I think that is smoke from the tires as the car was bottoming, going over some of the bumps on this two-mile track. Mike Mosley continues to lead as we look back in the back. That is Johnny Rutherford in car number one, representative of the defending match. National champion. Mosley is driving a car of Dan Gurney's. Now, Gurney has fallen on hard times recently. It has been, oh, what, three or four years since Gurney's car has really been that competitive. Well, Mosley has tried, uh, Dan Gurney, the whole operation has tried to get that engine working. Here's Scott Brayton down in the pits making a, what appears to be a less than routine stop. They're trying to get the car up on the jacks. Now they have done it. And they want to work on that left rear tire. And apparently change it. Maybe there's something else wrong in the suspension. And we will now update the standings. Mike Mosley leading. Johnny Rutherford running second. Bobby Unser is third. Al Unser is fourth. Rick Mears is fifth. Followed by Steve Krisiloff. Tom Sneva is now running seventh. A.J. Foy is currently in eighth. 
Garza is in ninth and also is running 10. That is an update as we have it through 60 laps. Boy, there we saw it again. Just a puff of blue smoke as a car went over that bump going into the third turn. They really bottom out going into that corner. Here Johnny is Rutherford. Johnny Rutherford sitting in second place behind Mike Mosley. Mosley has uh, a tremendous lead. In fact, uh, not even showing in the picture right now. The battle's really sitting back in second place. We'll put a clock on Mike Mosley and Johnny Rutherford to give you the seconds between them as they come by the start finish line. They're now Mosley is going through turn number three headed for four and Rutherford now goes into turn three. So almost a two turn difference. So Mike, we'll pick up the interval. Here comes Mike Mosley down to come across the line. Mike Mosley comes across waiting for Johnny Rutherford to come through now. And Johnny Rutherford comes through 5.4 seconds behind Mosley. So it is Mike Mosley continuing to lead Rutherford running second with Bobby Unser, Tom Steven, Al Unser in that order the top five. 62 laps complete of 250 laps a two mile oval here at Michigan International Speedway and in reality it is banked throughout the racetrack and we'll be back with 65 laps complete this is Mike Mosley he is the leader Johnny Rutherford is now running second Tom Steva has moved back to third Bobby Unser is fourth and Al Unser is running fifth what a terrific afternoon for Mike Mosley. Uh, he won the last race. Maybe Dan Gurney and the crew have finally found out what has plagued them for so long as the machine just is running so well. He pulls down the back stretch into the corner, runs anywhere he wants to on the racetrack. Johnny Rutherford is doing everything he can to chase him. Let's see if as he comes onto the main stretch now, we can get the interval between first place Mike Mosley and second place Johnny Rutherford. Mosley comes across the line. The clock is running before it was just a tick over five seconds it is about the same right now Johnny Rutherford hampered by traffic 5.4 seconds behind Mike Mosley in reality Rutherford is it has started to close because he dropped back a moment ago and he was at seven almost eight seconds behind Mosley well Rutherford now is still having to contend with some slower traffic Tom Sneva now running third Sneva, the early leader, dominated the race before Mosley took over. And for a few laps, Sneva had to do battle with Bobby Unzer, but he's finally been able to disentangle himself from Unzer and has moved cleanly into third place. 68 laps complete of 250 laps in the race. Mike Mosley's car continues to operate smoothly. The field, for the most part, has really strung itself out. There are a couple of small battles going on well down in the back, and we'll try to get a couple of those for you. But up in the front, it's Mike Mosley, car number 48, who is trying to win this race. And at the moment, doing a fine job, we have a car that has slowed, pulled off the course. Car number 96, that's Dick Ferguson, Dick Ferguson who has pulled down off the course. Apparently, something going wrong in his machine. And it doesn't look like uh, he is intending in any way to put it back in the race. But we'll keep an eye on 96 Dick Ferguson for you. But Mosley now leads Johnny Rutherford by almost the length of the back straight, which to give you an idea is e the length of 11 football fields. On this race course, speed is something so hard really to perceive. Mike Mosley is traveling every second well over the length of a football field. So the speed here coming on the main straightaway, he will touch 200 miles an hour and sometimes be a mile or two an hour over it. Looking again to pick up some interval. Mosley's already across the line. There comes Johnny Rutherford. We'll pick up the interval for you in a few minutes. The interval, we have been informed, was six seconds, so Mosley continues to edge away from Johnny Rutherford. 70 laps complete. A tremendous battle developing now at fifth place as Al Unzer and Steve Krisilov have been fighting back and forth. Unzer is now pushed past Krisilov. It's now lapping some slower traffic, and Krisilov has to string himself in. That's uh, Al Unzer out in front as he comes past the 57 car of Cliff Husel, and Vern Schupan is also in there, though they are being lapped at this moment. Al Unzer, 42 years of age, has 36 wins to his credit. Krisilov driving car number 40. And that is Andretti's car. It looks like here. Kevin Kogan has his problems. He's slowing on the racetrack. There is Kogan down low. Can't tell if he is under power or not, but this young man has been spectacular all year. He has quietly moved up to high. 
five place finish in almost all of the races he's been in. Here's Jerry Carl. He comes in picking up fuel from his pit crew. They decide the tires are all good. His stock block engine roars. He gets a drink of uh, some sort of fluid to refresh himself and throws the bottle back over the pit wall. It's a plastic bottle so it won't break and he's on his way. Mike Mosley the leader back to a final note on Kevin Kogan. He is a rookie but he is the fifth leading money winner this year. 72 laps complete. Mike Mosley still handily out in front. Second place is now Tom Sneva, who has managed to move up and put himself in a position behind Mike Mosley, though he is well back from the leader. Looking at the interval now, and this should be an interval to Johnny Rutherford, who is in second. 7.6 seconds. So on Rutherford, Mosley is picking up about a second every two laps as far as the interval is concerned. We have a yellow, yellow flag, flag out. is out. Yellow is out. Report is that we have a car slowed to a stop on the back stretch. Car number 73 has come to a stop. Car slowed on the back stretch. Apparently no problem. All of the crews are there with the machine. That's Kevin Kogan. That's car 73, but Kevin Kogan, who we saw slowing earlier, and he finally came to a rest, but he was in a precarious area. You can see him right on the edge of the racetrack, and so they had to turn the yellow flag on. We are under the yellow with 74 laps complete. The Michigan 500, Mosley leads. We'll be back in a moment. Car 31, that is Larry Dixon. He has stalled and has stepped out of his car. But we also, while we were away, had some more action in the pits. Well, we had Harry McDonald starting to pull out, and then the left rear tire bounced off. You can see the tire bouncing through the air in this replay, and Al Unzer darts over to miss it. Steve Krisiloff really takes a jump almost into the pit wall, and then Bill Alsop comes through, and Bob Lazier hits the brakes hard, then they both cut for their pits, and finally the tire rolls harmlessly over to the wall, but it was a tense situation for a moment. And let's look at it again. You can see it was like the, <laughs> the artful Dodger as far as the drivers were concerned just avoiding the tire that was going every which way. A tense situation in the pits. Larry Dixon's car has stalled. The reason for this yellow is as the result of Kevin Kogan slowing to a stop in a precarious area on the backstretch. A number of the safety crews now with Larry Dixon's machine at two of course will have to be pushed out of the way. Now let's go down to Bruce Jenner. Bruce. Charlie, right now I'm with a very interested spectator and worker, the wife of Rick Mears, Dina Mears. And uh, Dina, last week when you heard that the, the race was going, not going to go off because of rain, it was going to be held this Saturday, you had to be a little bit disappointed because today's your birthday. Yes, I was. I was very disappointed. Did you have plans back home? Yes, we were going to take our children to the beach and ride our three-wheelers. Yep. I noticed that you've been working very hard. Uh, Rick's time seemed to be going up and down. He hasn't been too consistent. What's the matter? The first of the race, he was right up there with 188s, 187s, 189s, and now they're just, they go from 186 to 181. I don't know if he's having problems with pushing or, or right. what it is. We were, I was standing right next to you when just a few pits down, the fire broke out. It had to bring back uh, uh, some bad memories. Did. It, it, I, I'm really afraid of it. I don't, lie. I don't think women should be in the pits. I don't know, maybe it's a reaction right now just from nerves, but it's, it's too scary and the fire happens too fast and I don't think the women should even be in the pits. I noticed that you moved your stand back. Yeah, I, we're farther away from the gas tank and that's where I want to be. Well, I don't blame you. Well, it'd be a nice birthday present if Rick uh, meets you in the uh, winter circle once it's all over with. I like that a lot. I hope he does win. I hope he's just laying back waiting, waiting for the finish and then he moves in on everybody. He does that a lot. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Nice talking to you. Let's go back to Charlie. All right. We're still under the yellow flag. We have several cars out of the race. Of course, on the fifth lap, Don Winnington spun, had an accident. Then Gordon Johncock got involved in an accident himself. They were talking about returning the car. They did not. Billy Engelhart went out on the 25th lap with transmission difficulties. And then Herm Johnson suffered that pit fire two laps later. On lap 27, the car was burned. It could not be re-entered into this race. 
And Paul, let me give you an update on the weather, and it is not that good an update. We're, we're receiving just a slight on and off drizzle, very light right now. Well, rain was threatened in the early forecast, but we thought we had enough time to get 500 miles complete. With the red flag, that has elongated, obviously, the time of the running by over an hour and a half, and so that forecast of rain is much closer to us. And as you said, Charlie, there's a light drizzle. They cannot run in the rain. They could go yellow and run under yellow for a few laps with a light drizzle, hoping for it to clear. But they could not race in the rain. All right, we're still under the yellow. 77 laps complete, and we'll be back in a moment with more of the Michigan 500. This is Charlie Jones and Paul Page. We're back at the Michigan 500 along with Gary Gerald and Bruce Jenner, who has been very active in the pits thus far. We're still in the yellow, Paul. Well, this yellow, of course, has uh, changed the pit strategy once again. They would be coming back to green uh, probably by the end of this lap. Larry Dixon, whose car stalled down at the end of the uh, at the end of the pit area, apparently had a fuel leak. They brought that around to his pit area, and they're now working on the car and in hopes of repairing it. So as they come to the green flag now, the pace car has begun to pick up its speed and pulls out ahead of Tony Bettenhausen, who leads at the moment. So it is Tony Bettenhausen in first, Bobby Unser second, Rick Mears third, Johnny Rutherford fourth, and Tom Sneva fifth. This will be the 80th lap complete when they come by the start finish line right below us. And we might make this note because of the weather situation. 126 laps makes it official. One lap over the halfway mark. Green flag is waving as Bettenhausen, Bobby Unser, Rick Mears, Johnny Rutherford, and Tom Sneva, the top five in that order. And it's Bobby Unser to keep our eyes on because Unser should move up rather rapidly. Tony Bettenhausen, a fine young driver, but uh, young is the key word. And the equipment is not that that Bobby Unser has under him, though. Tony's been doing a fine job this year, keeping in the races, driving a clean race, driving safe races, and he's still leading as they come around. In turn two, we have a report of a problem. Yellow flag is out again. Yellow flag is out with A.J. Foyt it into the Foyt. wall. A.J. Foyt. Foyt in turn two went into the wall, then it rolled down the wall. Thus far, though, there has been no fire, but A.J. is not moving. A.J. is not getting out of the car. Fuel leaking down across the track. The fire crews are there. The car is sitting firmly against the wall. The crews are at the machine. A.J. Foyt's number 14. The yellow flag is out again. And this will slow the race further. No movement indicated from A.J. Foyt's car. The crews on the scene will continue to watch. Pace car is back on the racetrack, and it will bring the fields around. A.J. still sitting in the car. Steve Edwards, who was instrumental in that last accident, is on the scene now looking over the car. The jaws of life. That's, what, that's, that's what that signal indicates. They're going to want to, those jaws to try and pry the car out. You saw it in our demonstration earlier. Steve Edwards, they can use it either to pry the car apart or they can use it to cut large pieces of metal. And it looks like that car is badly damaged on the right side. So they want to use the jaws to gently pry the car apart. They'll take their time. They, there's no reason for them to speed up at this point. They want to take it easy and make sure that they don't injure a driver any more than the injuries he might have sustained. In the old days, when they'd pick them up, Charlie, and just run with them, so, so often they would cause more injuries in the rescue than they did in the actual work. Dick Simon's car, he may have blown an engine from San Juan Capistrano, so he has dropped low on the racetrack. We, of course, are under the yellow with the situation with A.J. Foyt, and it, you may have noticed that one of the men immediately went in and put his hand behind A.J.'s head. Go back to the demonstration that we showed you earlier. When they move a race driver, they always want to protect that head and keep the, the head way forward. Well, that's the concern, it, it is a broken neck, a broken cervical spine, and you, you have to assume it. It's, it's very seldom true, but you have to assume it. There's those jaws of life, from the demonstration earlier. Now watch them just snip off the locking mechanism in this car from our demonstration. And bring incredible pressure to the tips of those jaws. 
And now they've got the, the door wedged open and here come the cutters in Steve Edwards hands. This is a demonstration videotaped earlier this week. And he will come in and just snip off the lock, which is holding the door together. There it is, and they get out. An incredible piece of machinery. It is used not only in racing, of course. It's used by fire departments and rescue services across the country with great success. It saved a lot of lives. And that, of course, is the machinery that they're using on AJ's car. Dick Simon has now come into the pits. Well, Dick has been in and out several times, and uh, that's AJ Watson was standing over the car. He has a rather disgusted look. I suspect it's the end of the day for him. So now we go back to the situation in turn two. This is AJ's pit crew. They're listening to a, a radio trying to get some information. That's a radio capable of monitoring the frequencies here. They're trying to find out what's going on. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Paul, we're down here in AJ Foyt's pit. The crew obviously very concerned. They're trying to monitor radio information. We passed car owner Jim Gilmore who went by us on a golf cart. He said that uh, their in initial report was it was a serious crash. Now let's listen in on this conversation. difficult problem here for us to understand what those radio transmissions are saying. Uh, crew, of course, just standing by waiting anxiously for any information that they can get. That's the situation at the moment here in the A.J. Foyt pit. And also, they just used a backboard to slide in behind A.J. And that, of course, is what Paul was talking about. You, uh, you assume the worst and you use every precaution possible. And that's to give support to the back, the neck, and to the head. Well, there's plenty of help there. Steve Edwards in the orange safety suit up over the top of the car. With his back to us is Dr. Steve Alvey. He is the medical director of CART. And they have a philosophy that the doctor should always be the same at every race course. That way the competitors know who they're talking to. And they have a certain level of confidence in someone who constantly takes care of them. And that who's, is who's with them now, Dr. Alvey. This is the accident in turn two. We're under the yellow with 83 laps complete. A.J. Foy, who just what, two, three weeks ago joined Cart to run particularly in this race. This is where he first made his impact against the fence. Was set to go last Sunday. We were postponed due to the rain delay. And uh, A.J. did not have an opportunity. He arrived late yesterday, did not have an opportunity to practice. Well, A.J. has been an absolute delight the entire time he has been here. He has spent plenty of time talking with folks, talking to the reporters that are here covering this event. Uh, I walked down to the end of the pits the other day and had a delightful conversation with him. He really has been enjoying what he's doing. He says he likes to race, and that's why he's here. All right, we'll be back, of course, with more of the Michigan 500 in just a moment. A.J. Foyt, they have now placed him into the ambulance. They had a small problem, just took a bit of time to get him out of his car that impacted against the wall in turn two. But he is in that ambulance and will be taken immediately to the field hospital here. Well, he'll go to that hospital for initial evaluation. They'll make a decision in the ambulance whether or not they should even stop there. If there is any reason, then they'll go right on to, uh, to the hospital. Let's go back and look just a moment ago. Here is the uh, scene at the car. A lot of people there, plenty of help as they were removing Foyt from the car, badly damaged on the right-hand side. But uh, rather rapidly, they were able to pick him up Get him out of the car, very careful when they picked him up to make sure that they didn't cause any additional injury. And they uh, brought A.J. Foyt out of the car, loaded him into the ambulance, and the ambulance now winding its way around the track, and then it'll make a decision based on the severity of injury, a situation that we know nothing about. We have no idea whether he is injured badly or not, but they are being very careful, and they will decide will they go to the track hospital or will they go on to another facility. And, of course, we also should point out that they do have a helicopter standing by in case that it is needed 
or they can take him to the hospital in the ambulance. Either way. Report to work. There's A.J. Foyt's car, so you can see how hard oh, it hit boy. that wall. Ripped the entire right side off of the car. But it looks to me like the cockpit is in pretty good shape. It's flattened. Remember these cars, Charlie, have deformable structure. That's a very important term. The idea is that when you hit something, that the parts will absorb the energy of the impact and the parts will come off and accidents will look like they're terrible because parts are flying everywhere. But in that action alone, the kinetic energy of the crash is being released and hopefully not being transferred to the driver. The car of A.J. Foyt impacting on the right side into the fence in turn two and then going down the fence. Yes, I got as you can see completely tearing out the right side. And now let's go down to Bruce Jenner. Bruce. Right now I'm with Steve Edwards, and Steve, how is A.J. doing? I noticed his car, the whole right side of it's gone. Yeah, he hit behind the line pretty hard on the left side, Bruce. He was pinned in the race car. We were able to extricate him. He was unconscious when we got to it. He was regaining consciousness when we put him in the ambulance. Uh, it'd be premature to state his condition right now, but he was regaining consciousness. He was talking. Uh, there appears to be some an injury to his right arm, and, uh, you know, that's all I can really tell you right now. But we do have him out of the race car, and he is on his way to the hospital. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. All right, Charlie, that's what's happened right down here with A.J. He's not in too good a shape right now. All right, Bruce, can you can you stay with Steve there just a minute? Certainly. Because he, you know, he was burned earlier. How is he doing? Because he's been all over the place. Well, I talked to him a second ago, and he seemed to be doing fine. Uh, he says that he's a lot of his foot, but uh, he's a busy man today. Okay, thank you, Bruce. So now A.J. Foyt on his way to the hospital, but Charlie... They have some situations out in that turn they're going to have to deal with. There is Foyt's car, badly damaged, and when it did that, it didn't only damage the car, it damaged the barrier. This is an Armco steel barrier all the way around, and now they're sending equipment out to look at the places where Foyt hits. This puts me, though not nearly as severe an accident, as that of Danny Gaius earlier this year at the Indianapolis 500. And while we have still a question mark about the, the full condition of A.J. Foyt, though I, it sounded like Steve Edwards, who is a trained and certified paramedic, was rather optimistic. He was unconscious at the impact, but his conscious level is coming back. He, he is now beginning to respond to them. So that's a good sign in itself. But Danny Gaius is recovering rather well from the reports we're receiving from his California hospital. And one interesting report, he apparently calls his race shop every day and gives them a few more instructions about what he wants to do on the race car. Last we heard, he was hoping to be back in a race car before the end of this year. We all certainly wish Danny Gaius well and hope to see him back in a car soon. And I also feel that he's probably watching the coverage in California right now. And uh, we tried to talk to him, but he has a list. And it's a very select list of the people that could call in and talk to him. And um, neither Paul Page nor Charlie Jones' name is on that list. Well, I saw Danny in the Indianapolis hospital just two days after his crash out at Methodist Hospital there. And I was amazed at the time, the tremendous strength of that guy, because he had a badly broken leg, and yet he was, uh, he was already trying to get exercise going. Now let's go down to Gary Gerald. Gary? Well, we're outside the compound, Charlie, along the infield hospital. The emergency vehicle, as you can see, has just arrived at the back door. Uh, all, of course, unauthorized people kept outside of this area, so we're just viewing in as they bring the gurney rather gingerly down from the emergency vehicle, and they'll be taking A.J. in for some preliminary observation. His crew has been anxiously standing by. A couple of them have now gone inside to be with their driver, and uh, they were anxiously awaiting that update report from Bruce Jenner and Steve Edwards over on the far side of the track. So at this moment, we'll just stand by here, and we'll wait until we can get some official word on the condition of A.J. Foyt. All right, Gary, and as soon as you get that, of course, just holler, and we'll get you right on the air. This is A.J. Foyt in turn two. This was when he had come to a stop. He hit the fence a little earlier in turn two and then just came sliding right down it. Well, it looks like the car just darted up into the wall. Having not seen the start of the crash, uh, we don't know what put it up into the wall and then it slid for some distance. Let's go back out to the accident site and Bruce Jenner. Right, right now we're at the, the car and the car is completely destroyed in the back, but you notice, I'd have to say, you know, the way the car has been constructed, it's been fabulous. It took the shot, the whole side of the car is gone. But the cockpit, where, the, where he would be sitting, has not really been damaged at all. Just the whole side of the car has been ruined. So really, it looks like nothing from the inside of the cockpit has been hit that terribly. But boy, did he take a jolt when he hit the side of that wall. Charlie? All right, thank you, Bruce. Of course, Bruce is uh, 
way away from our normal coverage and that's the reason that we're having a little bit of breakup on the RF mic but just as important to get the on the scene report and Bruce Jenner is there all right Johnny Rutherford leads Bobby Unser Tom Sneva we'll take a time out and be back in a moment. We're back at the Michigan 500. We are still under the yellow. We do not have any additional report on A.J. Foyt. He is currently in the field hospital here. And as soon as we receive that report, Gary Jero will be relaying it to us. They're still working on the fence out in the uh, second turn. They had uh, some damage up there. My guess, and this is simply a guess, with that kind of accident, it, it is one, usually as a result of a broken part. In the case of this kind of accident, the half shaft in the right rear will tend to break, and that immediately turns the car to the right because the power is now on the left rear wheel and up into the fence. It looks like that, though, I, again, I say we didn't see it. The official standings now with 90 laps complete. Johnny Rutherford is in first. Followed by Bobby Unser in second, Tom Sneva's in third, Rick Mears in fourth, and Mike Mosley's in fifth. Do you have an update on that? Well, we mentioned the weather, and yes. we're getting now some reports of drizzle out behind the uh, grandstand here. And the crews have radioed their teams, generally speaking, they're concerned that this race may not go a full distance. And so they've told their crews, under the possibility of rain, the crews are telling their drivers, stand on it when we go green. We are still under the yellow as we await the green. Of course, they're working on the safety fence in turn two, of which uh, was impacted or hit by A.J. Foy. We have uh, the listing as Johnny Rutherford, Bobby Unser, Tom Steva, Rick Mears, and Mike Mosley, the top five, and that is being sorted out, followed by Bill Alsa, Bob Lazier, Steve Krisloff, Al Unser, and Jose Garza. That is unofficial at this point because the official scoring is still being sorted out. Not really sure what that board meant. We're uh, actually 91 laps deep and they were showing it considerably deeper than that. So uh, the crews are all trying to pass a little information and every now and then Charlie they try and pass a little misinformation if it helps mess somebody <laughs> up behind you. All right there is Johnny Rutherford. Jim Hall is the owner of his car and the owner of an IndyCar a story unto itself. And Jim Hall is a unique owner who has been involved in all facets of racing. Paul Page tells the story of Jim Hall. When I go out and come in, it took us a while to, to develop the same language as it does with any new team or new operation, new situation. But uh, to go out and come in and say, the car is doing this, he says, aha, you know, because he's been there. Uh, many times when John describes something to me, I know just what he's talking about because I've felt that myself. Sometimes I have to say, well, I'm not quite sure how that uh, relates to what I did because I didn't drive any oval races, really. I, I did drive on some ovals, but I never really competed on them. Uh, so that I sometimes have to, uh, we, we have to exchange several times to get across how that affects the car on the oval. But other than that, I seem to be able to relate very well to what John tells me. Paul knows what he's talking about because he was a leading driver on the Can-Am circuit in the late 60s. Those days of road racing are fond memories for Hall. I stopped driving after the uh, 1970 season, and, and for me, I guess driving was, was as much fun as anything. I really did enjoy driving, and, and to win a hard-fought race where it was close and you think you won it on skill, there's probably nothing more exciting, at least not to me. Uh, I really did enjoy a couple of races that I had in my career, but I'll have to say that uh, winning in Annapolis has got to be the the uh, another real high point in my racing. Even though I'm not driving now, I, I do enjoy the design work, the, the building of the cars, the uh, team management. In the old days, Hall tested his own designs with great success. The first Hall wing cars were so good, they banned the cars. I think the sanctioning bodies tend to uh, see the more sophisticated teams outperforming the lesser teams. And 
they say, well, if we'll change the rules to stop the major teams from doing what they're doing, then we'll equalize the racing. But, but that's you, not you, what happens. You can't truly equalize No, that. you can't. And what happens is every time you make a change, the more sophisticated right. teams can change quicker. They're, they're, they react better and they make the changes so that they move away from the field rather than, than back to it. Uh, and then it takes the, the littler teams, the little guys, two or three years to catch up. And just as they catch up, a lot of the times the sanctioning body will change the rules again, and then they're left behind again. So I think that's a, a bad premise. So put me on a highway and show me a sign and take it to the limit one more time. And in all forms of racing, Jim Hall has been known for taking it to the limit. And now let's go down to Gary Gerald and see what the situation is with A.J. Foy. Gary? Charlie, we're standing outside the infield compound once again at the hospital. As you can see, the helicopter is warming up. Now, we do not have information that they're going to transport A.J. Foy to a nearby hospital, but we have to draw that conclusion. We did talk just moments ago as a very brief conversation with Jim Gilmore. He came out to tell members of the crew and the family that what was taking place, he just said, please tell everyone that A.J. is a tough old bird. He's going to be fine. He was smiling. We know he's conscious, so that's all we can report at this time as we stand by to see whether or not indeed they will be transporting A.J. Foyt from the infield medical facility. All right, thank you, Gary, for that report. And this man has been as important, I, th I think he's been the most important man in the history of IndyCar racing. Well, he has certainly been a key figure in the sport. He leads in all of IndyCar-type wins in history. Uh, he is the man that almost everyone consults when they want to make a move, when they need some advice, when they want to know which way to go in this sport. And I'm talking not only drivers, but promoters, sponsors, everybody. One of the first calls is always to A.J. Foyt to find out exactly what Foyt has to say about a situation. And so Foyt has been key for years. He continues to be key in the continuing conversations of the future of all of IndyCar racing. At age 46, this is A.J.'s 25th year of driving Indy cars and as Paul mentioned 67 wins four time winner of Indianapolis and seven times he has been the national Indy car driving champion. Now the pace car begins to head for the pit area. We anticipate a green flag momentarily and it will be Johnny Rutherford leading Bobby Unzer down to the line. As this race resumes, the green flag is out and they are racing once again at Michigan International Speedway. Johnny Rutherford across the line, then Bobby Unzer, then Tom Sneva and Rick Mears drops into fourth. Rutherford going into turn two with Bobby Unser right behind him. And again, these two cars quickly separate themselves from the field. It is Rutherford and Unser. This is a situation that we've seen throughout the afternoon with Tom Sneva. We've seen it with Mike Mosley. We've seen it with Rutherford and now with Bobby Unser. The two lead cars separating themselves from the pack, and there's a scramble behind them, but they continue to open the margin. Well, originally, they said that this should be a race of pacing, but the fact that we are getting much later in the day is result of the extensive yellow flags and the red flag. I think everybody has decided, forget pacing, let's go as fast as we can. Tom Sneva slowing down on the right track. He just suddenly began to drop back. Tom Sneva was running in fifth place and dropped back, so something seriously wrong in Sneva's machine, but he begins to pick up a little bit of speed now. He's still not really up to his previous racing speed as Gary Bettenhausen pulls alongside and passes him. So Tom Sneva slowing on the race course, and that may be the end of what has been otherwise a beautiful day for him. Sneva definitely off the pace and probably going to bring the car in. All right, so we'll keep a close eye on Tom Sneva to see if he comes into the pits, and then we'll try and pick up a quick report. As Johnny Rutherford continues to hold the lead on Bobby Unser, we have 97 laps complete of a 250-lap race. Johnny Rutherford leading handily, though he's battling with Bobby Unzer, and it's a tremendous battle. Let's go down to the pits and Gary Gerald. Paul, we can see at this moment A.J. Foyt, the veteran race driver of so many years, is being brought out now by the emergency crews to be loaded onto the helicopter here at this medical facility, obviously to be transported for further treatment at another hospital. We have no further information concerning his condition at this time. We would like to repeat that Jim Gilmore, his car owner, came out and said, 
A.J. will be all right. He's conscious. He's a tough old bird. And at that point, that's all the information we have. We had the earlier report that it was an injury from medical director uh, Steve Edwards on the scene to the right arm. The loading process continuing here now for the airlift evacuation of A.J. Foyt. The crash occurring over in turn number two, as you saw extensive damage to the Gilmore car number 14. And right now, trying to gingerly as possible lift the veteran driver off of the gurney on that flat board and into the helicopter which very shortly will be leaving the Michigan International Speedway grounds. You can see it's an extensive operation. It's one of those situations that no one ever likes to see in racing. Certainly we send our best wishes along with the man who has contributed so very very much to this great sport over so many years as he awaits further medical attention. We can see some movement there as A.J. trying to cooperate with the medical personnel who have been working so diligently over the past several minutes. That's an encouraging sign. And again, we go back to those words of Jim Gilmore, who said A.J. will be all right. So that's what we have to report at the moment. We'll stand by, and as soon as that helicopter gets in the air, we hope that we'll be able to update the information with a report from Dr. Olby or one of the CART spokesmen that is here within the compound at this infield medical center. All right, Gary, thank you for that report. And Paul, you and I know A.J. Foyt. You know at this moment that he's telling everybody what to do and how, how to locate himself into the helicopter so they get going. He may be a little bit feeble about his descriptions, <laughs> but if he's conscious at all, he's helping out, probably helping out with some drama, too. Now, this says one thing to me, and that is that the transport will be not to one of the local hospitals in Jackson, not the Foot Hospital, but probably on to the medical center that is, ex exists at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. Simply precautionary, once again, that, that looks fairly encouraging. We saw it two IV bags hanging, but again, that is a precautionary sort of thing. So let's just be careful and wait for the official report, but it does look fairly promising. And let's also locate where we are. We are about an hour and a half drive west of the Detroit Metro Airport, and it's only 30 minutes by helicopter to Detroit and, what, 15 minutes to Ann Arbor, which is about midway. They continue to load A.J. Foyt. They want to make sure he's secure. That's uh, Dr. Steve Alvey there, who is supervising the final loading procedure here. They have him into the uh, helicopter. And the yellow flag now being displayed on the race course. We'll give you an indication as to why, but I believe it's because Vern Schupan in car 33 slowed on the racetrack, necessitating the yellow, though we have another report that Bobby Unser may have just tagged the wall and then continued on, just white-walled the tire, as we used to say. Unser's car is in the pits now, and the crew is working on it. They have the car in. Here comes Johnny Rutherford coming in. As I said, the report, Charlie, was that Bobby Unser may have just tapped the wall. He is certainly in the pits for a long stop. Helicopter with A.J. Foyt now leaving. So all of the leaders now coming into the pits. Officially, we have 103 laps complete of a scheduled 250 lap race. And from all of us at NBC, we uh, wish you well, A.J., and hurry back because uh, racing's not the same unless you're in the field. So as the helicopter leads, leaves the racetrack, the question is uh, Bobby Unser's machine, because the report was that he just ever so lightly tapped the wall, but at 200 miles an hour, even the lightest brush can mean severe damage. And while we are under the yellow with the leaders coming into the pits, that means that Steve Krisilov is currently in the lead. Bobby Unser's car is sitting there. They're working on the right front of the car. Looking at the suspension, this is a long stop and not the kind that you can afford in a 500-mile race. And the yellow flag is out. All right, the standings. We have Krisilov out in front at this moment. And we'll be back with more of the Michigan 500. All right, we're back at the Michigan 500. Let's go down to Gary Gerald. Gary? While we're standing here now, we have Dr. Olvey, who has just come out from the infield medical center. Uh, Dr. Olvey, what can you tell us about the condition of A.J.? Well, first of all, Gary, he was alert and awake at the time that we sent him in the helicopter. He has a bad laceration and possible fracture of the right arm. 
a puncture wound and possible last uh, fracture of the left leg. He, uh, as I said, he was conscious and alert. There are no apparent internal injuries. So if all that holds true, he, he uh, should get along quite well. Now, where are where is he being transported? We're taking him to the University of Michigan Hospital in Ann Arbor. All right, Dr. Olby, thank you very much. You, That's sir. the official word at the moment on A.J. Foyt, who just left this medical infield compound here at Michigan International Speedway. All right, thank you for that report. Now, let's take a look at the official standings. Johnny Rutherford is the leader. Mike Mosley is second. Al Unser is third. Bill Alsup is running fourth. And Jose Garza is running fifth. So with Johnny Rutherford bringing the field around back to the green flag and the green flag flying once again, the question will be, will this become a sprint, Charlie? Johnny Rutherford comes down, drops below Jerry Carl and Gary Bettenhausen and sails off into the first turn. But the rest of the crews are going to have to decide, do they chase him or do they take it easy? It's getting a little darker. There's a possibility of rain in 20 laps. They could call the race officially. They would legally be able to call it should the rain down for them. That would be at 126 laps, which is one lap past the halfway mark. The problem of losing light is getting dark because it's overcast. The visibility, of course, is always a great question. More often than not, the problem is sunlight in the sunset coming into their eyes. But because it is overcast, it might give them a little bit of a break here. There is Bill Alsop currently running in fourth place and running smoothly. But he is closing in on the leaders right now as he comes up behind Mike Mosley. Alsop, as you know, if you've been with our coverage throughout the afternoon, is carrying the onboard NBC camera that has brought us some exciting shots today. Another problem to go back to the haze as it gets dark today. You begin to lose a depth perception. That's the first thing the drivers will notice. Darkness is certainly contributory to that and if you lose it then you don't know exactly where to let off though you can still do it by markers but it's certainly a problem. Bill also moves out and around Mike Mosley. What a fine job of driving he's doing and I wonder if Mosley is not suffering some handling problems because Mosley moved down low on the race course and also took the higher or the faster line. So also is now running in third. Garza is running in fourth as Mosley has dropped back to fifth. And as you know the early story was Mike Mosley because he charged to the front and was running away from everybody. It appears that Mike at this moment at least is nursing his car. Something else we probably ought to mention is that this ride with Bill Alsop right now is really something that he has waited for all his life. He has wanted to run in these big cars. He's wanted to run well, and he's doing it right now. Now let's go down to Bruce Jenner. Bruce? Well, right now they're working on Bobby Unser's car. And with me is Roger Penske. And Roger, what happened, do you know? Well, we lost a uh, right front uh, wheel bearing, it looks like. And we've changed the entire uh, right front upright. You're going to try to restart it and get him back in. Okay. Luckily, you had the spare parts. Yeah, we had the spare parts in the pits, and we lost uh, four or five laps. Uh, very good well, luckily, he's back out there. At least it was fixable. And they're having a bit of problem Sorry. getting uh, Bobby started out of the pits, but they've got him loose. At least they were able to get him back out on the track. Right, yeah. Well, we'll go up and see how far down we are, but it's going to be a long race, so we've got to stay in. That's probably good. Let's just keep the rain away. I hope so. <laughs> All right, Charlie. Roger Pinsky feels that now with 110 laps complete that there's still a lot of racing left here this afternoon with the weather and the overcast holding on. Well, Mike Mosley continues to fall backward through the field. He is now back in seventh position. Bob Lazier, Tony Bettenhausen, and Jose Lee Garza have all managed to get past him. Our leader is Johnny Rutherford. In second place is Al Unser, who we've not seen a great deal of throughout the afternoon, but obviously he's been doing a very fine job just taking it easy. He's a very smooth driver, not that spectacular, but he certainly does win a great deal. And he's managed to slide into second place, though so he's about a full straightaway back. And he's driving for Bobby Hillen's Longhorn Racing Team out of Midland, Texas. And of course, uh, Midland, Texas with Jim Hall is becoming one of the Johnny Rutherford's in trouble he's spinning it looked like something broke on his car Rutherford the leader spinning on the back stretch going into three I'm not sure he shredded a tire so Johnny Rutherford catches it gets it under control Charlie he can drive it into the pits here if they can repair it look the left front is up and freewheeling he is driving only using the right side he's keeping it going his concern is going to be how much damage that shredded tire is doing to the chassis 
losing right now because it's beating it hard. It's also hitting the ground and wearing away at the metal, but Rutherford's going to give a try out of it. He's headed down into the pit area. Everybody's going to have to watch because he's only going to be braking with two wheels when he gets there. He's coming in slow, being a little conservative. He brings it to a stop. Now the crew, Steve Roby and company, are going to have to go to work. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Johnny Rutherford up on the air jack. Steve Roby going to work as the crew chief on the backside. Roby is saying, cut it off, I believe. Apparently, the problem is substantial. They were prepared and were starting to change all four tires. You can see the flat spots on the tires after the spin. Roby, however, indicates that maybe the afternoon is over. We don't want to be premature. Now he's going back into action, trying to change. Rutherford steaming, of course, sitting in the cockpit after running up near the front all afternoon. Jim Hall out near the front of the car, supervising, trying to figure out and assess the damage. Roby now looking more dejected over on the right rear side. That, of course, was the tire that was shredded. You can see as Rutherford came in on the pits. Definitely a long, long stop. Whether JR will be able to get back in the race, we can't answer just yet. Certainly, if he does, his chances of victory have taken a tremendous pounding in this incident. Well, these ground effects cars depend upon that fiberglass to be able to sustain themselves out on the racetrack. The tire after it shredded, continued to hold on to the rim and was beating into that fiberglass. It looked like it destroyed a lot of it. I've said fiberglass. It's actually a graphite compound because it's much lighter than fiberglass. If they destroyed any of that right rear section of the race car itself, he would not have ground effects. Therefore, he couldn't race. And it looks like that's what it's done. Johnny Rutherford is unbuckled and is climbing out of the car. So it's the end of the day for Johnny Rutherford. Now let's go back and see what happened to Johnny Rutherford. And watch the great driving of JR. Well, it looked, you can see a chunk of tire. It just looked like the tire burst, whether he ran over something or what the problem was. But certainly the right rear let go. Johnny caught it, spun it away from the fence, and is now trying to drive it to a stop before it gets into anything. He's got it pointed straight. He's running across the grass. That's an incredible driving job because there's absolutely no adhesion on that grass. And then when he gets it out on the track, the left front is not touching. The right front is not touching. He's driving it on two wheels. Now let's go down to Bruce Jenner. He's with Jim Hall. Bruce? Jim, what happened? Uh, uh, John hit some trash on the straightaway. It uh, cut the right rear tire, and he spun it through 360 degrees. It's torn up the... Uh, suspension on the right rear and it did take an hour to fix it so we're going to roll so, it away. That's it huh? Yeah. I guess that's racing huh? I guess How disappointing. So. Yeah a little. <laughs> Luckily you got the good days. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Charlie. That's that's not a little disappointing. That's a lot disappointing. For Johnny Rutherford and Jim Hall that is a giant disappointment. They take their racing very seriously. And they certainly should. All right. We're at the Michigan 500, one of the yellow, 114 laps complete. We'll be back with more of our race coverage in just a moment. We're back under the yellow, now 115 laps complete. So we'll have at least one more lap to go. Under the yellow, let's go down to Gary Gerald. Well, Charlie, here's Johnny Rutherford. And John, first of all, you did a magnificent job of hanging on to that race car. That's got to be one of those moments when the heart comes right up in the throat. There's not time enough for the heart to come up in the throat. It happened so quickly that I don't honestly know which, which happened first, but evidently we we lost a right rear and a left front. And uh, I don't know whether the left front went after I got into the infield, into the gravel, and it punctured a hole in it, or whether it was, I think it was gone before because it was distorted and flopping, but the right rear let go, and a car did a, did a 360 uh, down the back stretch and went off into the uh, infield grass, and I came back out, put it in gear, started the engine, got, it was, the engine had died, mm -hmm. and I started the engine and drove it back into the pits, and uh, the damage was too severe to the right rear suspension and uh, parts of the car that we couldn't continue. It appeared as you pulled up in the pits after you drove it back in, you had every intention of getting that thing back on oh, yes. and back on the race track. Yes, uh, we had the race won, I reckon. Uh, the car was was working finally very good and we were out running everybody on the racetrack uh, had a nice comfortable lead made our pit stop things were you know I think and looking real good and uh, that's racing. Well, I'm glad you're able to smile about it. I don't know if everybody could in this situation, but John, I know there'll be a lot of other days. We look forward to seeing you next week in Milwaukee. Oh, we'll be there for sure. You can count on it. All right. That's the story in the Johnny Rutherford pit. Let's go back upstairs. We've had quite an attrition rate today. We started with 37 cars. We're down now to 21 cars as we are under the yellow. 115 laps complete. This will be 116 as we come by the start finish line. And Paul here, who the, the cars that have dropped out. Well, on lap 
lap number five, it was Bill Whittington that came out of the race. Uh, 23 laps in, Bill Tempero had an engine failure. Herm Johnson, his fire in the pit. Salt Walther, an engine failure at 53 laps. Then Dick Simon, his turbocharger, finally gave up. Kevin Kogan suffered a fire in the pit. It affected him on the straightaway, and he had to pull it in. And Johnny Rutherford, of course, we just saw him with the blown tire. Apparently, he ran over something uh, out on that back stretch. So Johnny Rutherford out of the race. And by the way, Charlie, the identical thing happened to Johnny Rutherford three years ago here. You will remember when he Turn ran four. over the nose of Danny Angaius' yep. car after Angaius tagged the wall, and he did the same thing. He caught it and drove it in, hoping to change the tire. He was coming right, he went right through the grass, the infield headed for the pits, and he wanted to get back out on the race. Here are the official standings, Al Unser and Bill Alsop running one, two, they're together. Cars is running third, Lazier fourth, and Mosley is running fifth. And they are also running together. So those are the battles that will be shaping up when we go back to the green flag. Perhaps we should repeat A.J. Foyt has an apparent compound fracture of his right arm, a puncture wound, and a possible fracture of his left leg, and should now be at the University of Michigan Medical Center. He was taken there by helicopter. So we're still under the yellow at Michigan International Speedway. The car is being brought around, and it has been Al Unser that has been able to move up to the front. Well, this has been uh, one of those days in racing that you hear about, but that you don't want to see again. We've had a lot of accidents. Uh, we've had a lot of yellows because of it, and we've had a red because of the, of the fire. And we ask Al Unser, does an accident bother him while he is racing? The only thing I think that, that a driver is concerned about is making sure that if something happens to somebody and uh, that they get out of the car okay and everything's fine and that's with my brother that's the only thing I'm concerned about if, if he is involved in one uh, in an accident uh, as long as he gets out of it uh, uh, it doesn't bother me. And Paul, the, all of the race drivers at any level have that ability to pull the screen down when accidents happen. The theory being that uh, it won't happen to me, it'll happen to somebody else. But in, in reality, it's happened to almost everybody that has been in racing at this level. Yes, but it should not be treated as uh, an irreverence or anything. It is simply what professionally you have to do to be able to do well at this sport. They call it drawing the curtain across your eyes. You concentrate on driving and not on anything else. It becomes a fact of life in auto racing in reality. Of course, A.J. Foyt, also out of the race, we did not include him a moment ago as a result of the accident out in the second turn. And we'll be back with more of the Michigan 500 right after these messages from your local station. We're back at the Michigan 500. We have officially 118 laps complete. Right now, the leader under the yellow is Al Unser. Bill Ossip is running second. Garza third. Lazier and then Mosley. Let's go down to Bruce Jenner. One of the most dramatic breakthroughs in safety for cars is A.J. Foyt's car, who is totally destroyed. The whole right side is gone from the car. Is this little piece of equipment right here? It's called the Aeroquip Crashworthy Fuel Coupling. Because of this piece of equipment, it has substantially reduced the possibilities of fire. As you saw in A.J.'s car, when it did hit the wall, it did not break into flames. Where right behind me, this pit was totally destroyed when they were trying to refuel. So they've been able to substantially reduce the possibilities of fire with this little piece right here. It's interesting that the development of the crashworthy fuel coupling stemmed from combat action in Vietnam. As helicopters ferried troops and made raids, they were often victims of enemy fire, and frequently the results were tragic. Ultimately, however, came the design and refinement of a coupling between the fuel line and the tank that would break apart on impact and automatically seal off each half of the hose before it would break, a procedure now effectively adapted to race cars. The tanks and fuel systems were tested at Avsur in Phoenix, Arizona, and then committed to full-scale dynamic testing. And the tests were eminently successful. And the valves were used on the now-famed Huey helicopters in Vietnam, applied, uh, used, evaluated, and they were very, very successful in Vietnam, uh, such that thermal trauma was virtually eliminated in 1973, there was a rather significant crash at Indianapolis, 
in which an individual died as a result of his thermal injuries. And at that time, it was elected to study the technology used in aircraft and perhaps apply it to race cars. Now a feature on all race cars, the crashworthy coupling brakes on impact, sealing off both sides of the hose line, which prevents loss of fuel and substantially reduces the hazard of fire. Well, I guess the proof is in the pudding. AJ's car was totally destroyed and there was no leakage of fuel. So this little device has been out for seven years. There has been no death because of fire. I guess it works. Makes it a little bit safer. Charlie? All right, thank you, Bruce, for that report. Right now, under the yellow, Al Unser is leading. Bill Alsop running right next to him is in second. Osele Garza is running third with Bob Lazier in fourth right next to him. Followed by Mike Mosley, Rick Mears, Tony Bettenhausen, Steve Krisloff, Bobby Unser, and Pancho Carter, those being the top ten. Osele Garza moves his car back and forth on the track, trying to keep the tire temperatures up. He's become a wonderfully popular young driver this year. And uh, the fans just love this young driver from Mexico City. During last week's Sports World, we aired a sports journal report about the controversy between USAC and CART, the two sanctioning bodies of IndyCar racing. At the end of the report, we stated that John Cooper, president of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, refused to be interviewed and, quote, refused to permit, end quote, any other spokesman from USAC to appear in the story. We incorrectly attributed this statement to Mr. Cooper. The statement was made to Sports Journal by Dick King, the president of the United States Auto Club. The green flag is out and flying at Michigan International Raceway, and Al Unser acknowledges it and picks up the speed. He is leading this race, and in coming back to the green, he really turned on the power and left Bill Alsop in second place, sitting some distance back, almost a half of a straightaway now, as there comes Bill Alsop off the corner. Also in the battle coming up toward the front is Jose Le Garza and Bob Lazier. So a battle for first, a battle for second. There is Garza leading Lazier into turn three. Battles in two positions on the racetrack. Al Unser, 42 years of age, Bill in his first, Bill Alsop is second, he's 43, and then we have the youngster, Garza, 22, and then Bob Lazier at age 42. We mentioned earlier, this is a sport for the old folks. Well, Bob Lazier comes out of road racing. In fact, I raced against him in the Formula Ford several times. He's a very smooth driver because he learned in that category of running in the Formula Fords, which is a machine without a great deal of power. You see Bob Lazier sitting right behind Jose Le Garza, who learned his driving in the go-karts. In fact, won his first race in Mexico in go-karts, another area that really teaches you very young how to go fast. There's two very fast men. Lazier, a former Super V champion, listed as a rookie in champ cars, though. This is his first full year out. It is his first full year, and he has really pleased crowds. So the first time we saw him back at Phoenix when NBC covered that race, it was in the second lap that unfortunately he got tangled with another car and pushed up into the wall. And when we saw him climb out of the car, he was such a disappointed young man. Now Bob Lazier is making his bid as they come upon slower traffic, but Garza is picking the high line, and Lazier has decided that that is the place for him to be. He's going to stay back behind Jose Le Garza, at least until they come off the corner, but it's quite a battle for third place that we're seeing here. So a pair of rookies running in third and fourth, but 20 years of age separating them. Garza now picking up on the high side, and Lazier continuing to follow, though it appears that Lazier is just casually staying behind him. Let me assure you, that is not the case. Lazier is trying every trick in the book that he knows. As he closes up, pulls power on the straightaway, drafts behind Garza, and pulls out alongside. Now can he hold the line low on the track? Apparently he cannot. Garza picks up the high side, and Lazier is forced to duck in behind him once again. These cars are capable of drafting. You saw it there. Though the one thing they really have to do is to keep the aerodynamics working on the chassis they have to keep one half of the car out in clean air so they don't draft directly behind just half behind because they still need the downforce that's created by the ground effects Jose Lee Garza of Mexico and earlier we asked him how does he feel about running with the veterans It's quite exciting and it puts a lot of pressure on you because uh, it's not easy to run wheel to wheel with one of those guys knowing that, um, you know, they, they've got so much more experience that they can get you anywhere they want. Boy, doesn't he have a great smile? <laughs> one of the handsome young men in auto racing. 
First time we saw him was at Phoenix this year when he captured the crowd there and went on of course to capture it as everyone knows at Indianapolis where he was named the rookie of the year. Well, watch Bob Lazier as he uses that drafting technique once again he's trying to build up revs and hopefully can just get his nose ahead of Garza as he comes into the turn. The distance is about 25 feet but Garza is able to maintain his position a little higher on the racetrack though Lazier closes up very slowly. While it is a race at speeds of around 200 miles an hour it is really measured in inches. Can I get three or four inches one foot maybe on the fellow in front of me there Lazier makes his try once again Bob Lazier pulling alongside on the inside of Garza. You see it from an aerial shot. Bob Lazier has managed to push by Garza and picks up third place. Al Unser, Bill Alsop, Bob Lazier in third and Garza is running for Rick Mears is still in fifth followed by Mike Mosley, Boncho Carter, Tony Bentonhausen, Steve Krisiloff and Bobby Unser. So Bob Lazier uses drafting to his advantage and gets past Osele Garza and is sitting in third place. It's an exciting battle that we're watching for third place. Al Unser is our leader. Bill Alsop sits in second place. Officially now 131 laps complete. So the race is official. We had to go 126 in case they had to call it because of the weather or because of the loss of life. There is Pancho Carter who has moved up into fifth place. Now you remember he's had quite a course to get there. He started out toward the front and then he got involved in some oil along with Larry Dixon. He spun the car out in the first turn all the way down onto the grass and was able to keep the engine running keep it started and now has moved up and he is right behind Jose Legarza who is sitting in fourth place and Carter despite the spin is really moving up hoping to challenge for the lead. So the top five Al Unser, Bill Olson, Bob Lazier, Garza and then Pancho Carter as Carter sets sail for position number four. Garza will try and hold him off as we'll be checking out that battle. Now an interesting thing on Garza he has changed his racing setup and since we saw him earlier this year in Phoenix. In other words he uh, was involved in a partnership and now they figured they would go ahead and run their own operation. Apparently he made the decision that trying to field two cars was very difficult. He had Jeff Brabham the son of the world driving champion driving as a teammate with him. But I think Garza finally decided it really takes too much energy to try and keep two cars going especially in your rookie year. So he's concentrating on his own ride. Here is Pancho Carter now beginning to challenge Jose Lee Garza for fourth place. Garza is out in front the rookie Carter the longtime veteran and he has really shown the worth of years of driving experience on this track today. Now he's going to try Garza on the low side coming into the turn. Garza running smoothly around the corner and Pancho right up behind him ducks in behind him hoping to pick up the draft. Pancho Carter at age 30 but this is his eighth year of driving championship cars. He is a former midget and sprint car champion. He has the experience over Garza comes in underneath him and he takes it. Pancho Carter moves into fourth place. Now Garza has been passed twice. He's dropped now from third to fifth. Is he beginning to slow down. Well you have to ask that question. We'll try and get a clock on him up here and find out if he is running at his normal speed. It appears that he has and he's just been outdriven in this case by Pancho Carter who I can't say enough about the drive that he's done today moving from the from the front to the back and then back up to the front once again. So there is Garza. The question is maybe it is mishandling now and he is being forced to slow down just a little bit. The clock is on Jose Lee Garza car number fifty five. He Garza brings it around. Mexico City we have officially one hundred and thirty five laps complete of a scheduled two hundred and fifty lap five hundred mile race here at the Michigan International Speedway. And at this point in the race there are nine cars running on the leader lap running with the leader Al Unser. Here is Garza. This clock time will be slightly affected now because he has the slower car of Phil Kaliva in front of him. Kaliva moves up and gives him racing room. Garza comes around 37 38 seconds 39.2 seconds the one lap speed for Jose Lee Garza he's averaging just over 183.6 miles an hour. That's a pretty good racing speed though it's it's well down off of the speed that he was qualifying at. Jose Lee Garza of Mexico City currently in fifth place. The leader is Al Unser and we've got a problem. Car number 64. That is Steve Chassis. And now let's go down to Bruce. Here's a man who with me today right now Dick Simon who has had his problems. Uh, 
Tell us about it. From right from the beginning of the day, your pit got burned up and you lost everything. Yes, we did, Bruce. Actually, we were very fortunate nobody got hurt in the pits. The pit in front of us, Herm Johnson's caught on fire and the wind was blowing our direction. Burned everything up completely. Thanks to a lot of teams, we were able to get uh, back into the race. They loaned us some parts, uh, spare tires, etc. cetera. Uh, unfortunately, when we got back in, the engine blew up a few laps later after the turbocharger broke. We came in, changed that, and went back out in the engine. It just wasn't our day in one side, but on the other, the fellow team members were very gracious to us, and I'd have to thank them. And I'm just glad we were here. What about the visibility out there? It started getting a little bit darker right now. You just came in a minute ago. Was it getting a little bit tougher for the drivers? Well, Bruce, I think that the visibility uh, it really doesn't matter that much because it's clear enough and bright enough that you can see. And as it gets a little darker, it seems like the track turns a little blacker as far as through the helmet. I don't think that's a problem at all. I think actually the race is, uh, track is good and the race is a good one. I think uh, the people are seeing a good race. They certainly are. Sorry you're out of it. It's always next week. Well, I wish we were in it too. Our sponsor, Vermont American, has a lot of people here. All right. Charlie? There's Steve Chassis' machine. He pulled it off the race course and right up to the gate, apparently out. Steve from Indianapolis, Indiana. This is the identical machine to Mike Mosley's car. He's been helping with the research. It's a stock block powered Dan Gurney 1981 Eagle. Running second is Bill Alsop, and running third is Bob Lazier, who you see here. And the separation as Lazier tries to close on Alsop. The leader is Al Unser in car number eight driving the Longhorn Racer. And the standings through 138 laps, Al Unser, followed by Alsa, Lazier, Carta, and Garza. Now Bob Lazier heads into the pits. And we'll be back with more of our coverage in just a moment. Pancho Carter sitting up in the lead. And an interesting thing is that one that Al also, uh, Bill also has stayed up toward the front, but more interesting and probably more as a result of the pit stops, but he's doing a fine job today is car number 16, Tony Bettenhausen, who has managed to stay up near the front. The official standings at the moment, Al Unzer leads, Bob Lazier second, Rick Mears third, Steve Chrysaloff fourth, and Pancho Carter down in fifth. Now that is coming out of the pit stops. Rick Mears is currently running up among the leaders, and uh, he is one of the young titans that we will be seeing more and more in IndyCar racing. And most of the time, we uh, we see him just in the cockpit of a race car, so we forget the uniqueness of the young man, such as Rick Mears, one of the outstanding drivers of IndyCars that we've had the enjoyment of watching over the past few years. Rick Mears burst onto the scene with major success, the same as he had in the early 70s in off-road racing. His Indy win was a major victory on his way to the 79 National Driving Championship. But the real thrill was just driving for the Roger Penske team. It, uh, it, it surprised me as much as it did anybody, and uh, he told me he had a deal to offer me, and there wasn't any way I could refuse it. So uh, I guess I'd run champ cars for about a year, a year and a half, and I was fortunate enough that I got in some equipment that would stay together. And that's the game plan we followed. We, we knew we couldn't outrun the guys, so we just tried to outlive them, and that's what we, we worked on. But the star of 1979 and 1980 gave way to the eventual national driving champion, Johnny Rutherford, and his teammate, Bobby Unzer. But the senior member of the Penske team knew Rick was to be reckoned with. Rick is plenty quick. There's nothing wrong with him. He's, he's quick, he's reliable, he's not apt to make so many mistakes. He makes far less mistakes than most drivers that go as fast as he does, and he darn sure goes fast. And I, sure he goes through some learning curves, but guys, you gotta figure out that the guy really doesn't have that many years of experience as far as driving champ cars or Indy cars, and I just, uh, I, I think he's probably the best of what I would call the young breed or the new breed. When Rick Mears burst back into the national spotlight once again, it was again at Indianapolis. But this time, his car was on fire in the pits. A refueler had sprayed over Rick Mears, and it caught fire. Mears was burned on his face. But then he came back at the twin Atlanta races. Two wins back to back, even shutting the door on Mario Andretti on the last lap of the last race. It was an important day, especially important for Rick Mears. It was a victory that he badly needed. It was very good. It uh, it helped. It helped get me back on course. Uh, it helped get me some of my confidence back. Uh, I really felt good for the guys. It helped them 
uh, a couple of them were hurt, I felt worse than I was. And uh, I was really happy for them to be able to get back into the swing of things uh, as quick as we did. And it, mainly I think it just helped for the team's confidence all the way around. Rick Mears is certainly strong behind the wheel. He has victories to prove it. But if he needs improvements, Bobby Unzer says that is his technical background that he needs to work on. Well, I, I think that Rick will have to start working, to more, working more on development work. I think he has a ways to go on that yet. I think he has quite a ways to go on it. Still, Rick Mears is living a young driver's dream and he is happy with the Roger Penske team. Working for Penske is great. It's, uh, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me, and I've had a lot of people say, well, isn't he a slave driver? Isn't he tough to work for? And he's really not. The guy has just, he's been exceptionally well with me, and I think as long as you hold up your end of the bargain and get the job done, uh, there's no problem whatsoever, as long as you perform. Rick Mears, one of the young titans of IndyCar racing. And when Bobby Unzer and Johnny Rutherford and A.J. Foyt decide to hang it up, it will be Rick Mears that will assume his proper position in championship racing. Rick Mears currently running in six as we're back under the green, Paul. And Pancho Carter is leading. We are back under green. That is Al Unzer that is sitting back one car behind Pancho Carter. Al is in the second place, so he has begun his chase for Pancho Carter. And I'm not sure that we see a slight show of smoke at the right rear of Pancho's car there. Al Unzer trying to make his closure now. Al in second place. He has his sights set on our leader, Pancho Carter. So the official standings now at Pancho Carter in first. Al Unzer running second. Tony Bittenhausen is running third. Bill Alsop is fourth. Bob Lazier is fifth. Rick Mears is sixth. Off is seventh and Tom Bigelow is eighth. Gary Bittenhausen is running ninth. We have 17 cars remaining. We started with 37 on the grid today. In the case of both Pancho Carter and Rick Mears, we're talking about some very smooth racing drivers. They've been doing a fine job. Here is a battle for third place. Tony Bettenhausen in car number 16 is in third, and Bill Alsop is sitting right behind him trying to pick up third. 152 laps complete, so we have 98 laps to go in the Michigan 500. Tony Bettenhausen moves below the slower car of Phil Kaliva. Bill Alsop does the same as he is chasing Alsop. This is a battle for third. And Bettenhausen has some slower traffic to continue to contend with. Alsop is sitting right behind him. It seems that Bill is just biding his time, waiting until they spring out of this traffic, and then he will go up and begin his challenge. We would like to point out that the camera on Bill Alsop's car that we had the early coverage is no longer working, so we do not have that shot live for you as we had earlier. In case that you might be just looking for it, Pancho Carter, Al Unser running 1-2, Bettenhausen also running 3-4. Now Tony Bettenhausen continues to pass slower traffic on his way in third place. This young man has worked very hard with his equipment this year. He goes around Larry Dixon. It is a dream. He comes out of a racing family. His father was a race driver. Two of his brothers, Merle and Gary, are race drivers. He's a fine young man. Now let's go down to Gary. We're standing down here, we've just... We've just checked in at the Enfield Medical Center trying to get updated information on A.J. Foyt. We understand from the chief doctor here that the helicopter arrived safely in Ann Arbor. A.J. is now en route in ground transportation from the helicopter landing site to University Hospital, the University of Michigan Hospital in Ann Arbor. We understand that the problem, he was resting comfortably, experiencing pain, as could well be expected, with the right arm. We are told that he was kibitzing with the nurses, however, which is certainly an encouraging sign. They're awaiting him now at University Hospital in Ann Arbor. So continued encouraging reports on A.J. Foyt. Thank you, Gary, and that is encouraging. We now have 155 laps complete, 95 laps to go. Pancho Carter is the leader, followed by Al Unser, Tony Bittenhausen, Bill Alsop, and Bob Lazier. We'll be back with more of our coverage in a moment. Along with Paul Page, Gary Sherrill, Bruce Jenner, this is Charlie Jones, Michigan 500. Pancho Carter is the leader. We want to alert you across the country that uh, in about five or six minutes, those of you in the east and the central time zones, some of the stations will be cutting away for NBC's nightly news. After the nightly news, they will, of course, then come back to us for the conclusion of this race, but many of the stations in the west, you just stay with us, and we will continue with our coverage throughout the afternoon and the early part of the evening here in the east. There is Pancho Carter, the leader. He is maintaining about a two and a half second lead over Al Unzer in second place. And occasionally in the aerial shots we did just a moment ago, you can get an idea of what 
race driving is all about as he pitches the back end around and lets the back end slide a little bit. Pancho Carter leading Al Unzer. Al in the blue and white number eight as Pancho Carter takes her through the second turn and down the back straightaway still about two and a half seconds between Pancho and second place Al Unzer. And what an afternoon this would be for Pancho Carter. This young man is going for his first IndyCar win. He is currently in the lead at age 30, the former midget and sprint car champion. And he started driving championship cars or Indy cars as they are better known when he was only 22 years of age. Well, Pancho Carter comes from Brownsburg, Indiana, a western suburb of Indianapolis, and grew up in the shadow of the Speedway. Another man that comes from a racing family. And the relatives, uh, Johnny Parsons is related to him, Dwayne Carter, the, the whole group grew up in the shadow of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. They wanted to race. He's come up through racing his whole life. He had a very bad crash on the 2nd of December in 1977 that almost stopped his racing career, but he worked hard to come back. The battle for fourth place between car number seven, that is Bill Alsop, and car number 35, Bob Lazier. Alsop is in his third year of racing championship cars in Lazier and car number 35, although 42 years and a former Super V champion is listed as a rookie, his first full year out on this particular circuit. Here comes also and Lazier right behind him using the benefit of the draft and also a bit of the benefit of Tony Bettenhausen being in front of him as he comes low and is looking to get by Bill also. Now, if he can get that job done, then he sets sail for third place, car number 16, Tony Bettenhausen. He doesn't have the job done yet. And here they come, side by side, down the back straightaway. That's Tony Bettenhausen out in front. So this is a three-car battle for third place. And Luzier is the man that's trying to get past Alsop. And then, hopefully, in the same swoop, it'd be nice if he could come up and take on Tony Bettenhausen at the same time. But both Bill Alsop and Tony Bettenhausen will have something to say about that. The ideal position seems to be underneath for the key passing that we've seen throughout the afternoon. Well, it's certainly where his car is working at the moment. He's sitting down behind Alsop. He gets past Alsop, moves into fourth place, and is now chasing Bettenhausen. Many of the stations, by the way, will be going away for the NBC Nightly News. Those of you in the West will stay with us for the conclusion. We'll be back in a half hour over most of these stations as we continue our coverage of the Michigan 500. Pancho Carter is the leader. Al Unser is running second. Bob Lazier is third. Bittenhausen, that is Tony Bittenhausen, car number 16, is running fourth. Fifth is Bill Alsop in car number seven, and Alsop goes after him. So Bill Alsop on the inside, the side of the racetrack that everybody's been using, the low side to get by. Bettenhausen stays up high, but Alsop wants to take a try on the low side on Bettenhausen, but that higher line has paid off, and Bettenhausen maintains his position over Alsop. Bettenhausen in fourth, Alsop in fifth. Rick Mears is currently running in sixth. Tom Bigelow is seventh. Gary Bittenhausen is eighth. Scott Brayton is running ninth. Roger Rager in car number 66. His car was in the pits for a very long time. We see that he has returned to the race course once again. They were working on the engine. And we also have been informed that Bill Vukovic is now running 10. Well, we've maintained a smooth race, so Jerry Carl has slowed down. Apparently something seriously wrong in his machine. And he is running on the low side of the race course, trying to limp his way around. Jerry Carl, who has struggled so hard with that stock block engine for so long, he had said before the race he thought his was really dependable and would go to the finish. And the reason that he is staying out there at those speeds is that with the attrition rate that we have had, he could well end up in the top 10 because we may only have 10 cars left running. Well, every extra lap, of course, counts. It's the same reasoning that they use when they try and pit on the downside of the start finish line. Even if you come in and are out of the race when you come in, by simply crossing over the line, you pick up one more lap. Tony Bettenhausen and Bill Alsop continue their battle for fourth place. Bentonhausen in car number 16, Bill Alsop in car number 7. Alsop coming in underneath, but Bentonhausen has been able to continually hold him off. Can Alsop get him this time? Alsop pulling alongside, taking advantage of hopefully a little faster car as he comes across and actually pushes in front of Bentonhausen. Now he can pick up the faster line. You see Bentonhausen close a bit, but Alsop now has moved up and picked up fourth place. So it is Pancho Carter in first, Al Unser still in second, Bob Lazier's third, Bill Olsen now in fourth, and Tony Bentonhausen is running fifth. We have completed 
169 laps of the race. Our leader is still Poncho Carter in car number five, who is sailing out in front, running smoothly. He is not challenged by anyone. Al Unzer is sitting in second place, and then Bob Lazier has managed to move into third after that with both Alsop and Bettenhausen. But Poncho Carter has not been any of that fight. He has generally had a clear race for it, of course, in front of him. We now have 80 laps to go, 170 complete. How many more pit stops are we looking at? Well, they run about 36 laps, 72 miles to a pit stop. They're figuring 1.8 miles to the gallon. So uh, with, with that to go, they still have at least one more stop. There's Bob Lazier into the pits. This is a stop under the green. It is a routine stop. They're not changing tires, though Derek Moore, the crew chief, is talking to him. They're not done fueling. He started to pull before they were done. They're trying to get every drop of fuel that they can into that machine. This stop is going long. They're still fueling the car. They're holding the car up, trying to get all the fuel in. Of course, there's not as much fuel to push down and get into the tank. So in 24 and a half seconds, Bob Lazier is back on his way. All right, let's go back to an explanation. Why is there not that fuel to push it into the tank? Well, in the tank in the opening laps of the race is obviously full, over 200 gallons of fuel in there. But in the later stages, there's very little fuel. It's gravity fed. There's no pressure pushing it in. So you just have to wait until it all runs in. And of course, you want to get every drop you can in there. Here's Bobby Unzer heading into the pit. And he, of course, had the problem with the right front earlier. Now he has another problem. They don't even bother to connect the refueling rig. They're looking at the back of the car. But Bobby Unzer has begun to unsnap things on his helmet, so he apparently thinks the day is over, though he's staying in the car. And now the crew leans down to talk to Bobby Unzer, who's not had a good day. First place is Poncho Carter. He is being chased by Al Unzer. And you can see the margin that Poncho Carter is holding over Al Unzer. And we will pick up the interval between Carter and Unzer as they come by the start-finish line. We've completed 172 laps. This is lap number 173. Two point five seconds is the interval, which is what they have been running now for about 10 laps. So they seem comfortable in their positions, though I'm sure Al Unser would like to close up and pick up the back end of Poncho's car. Now, of course, should there be another yellow, then that will happen automatically. So maybe Al is saying there's no reason at this point in the race to really push it. I'll just wait and see what happens. I'm comfortable running at this speed. Let me just stay here and keep the leader in sight. Now let's go down to Gary Jarrow. Now we're down here alongside a rather dejected Steve Krisiloff. Steve is just now out of the race in the Patrick car number 40. Steve, this is particularly frustrating because you were running better just before you went out of the race than early. Well, we were. We kind of planned to take it easy in the beginning and uh, wait for some of the traffic to clear out and, uh, you know, start running harder at the end. And that's what we started to do. We were, we were running as fast or faster than anybody on the racetrack. And uh, something just happened to the engine. We're not sure yet what. You, you said that you only had a couple of guys to run down. I take it you felt confident you were going to be able to catch Carter and Unser up there. Yeah, we were running faster than they were, you know, so it was just a matter of time. Well, Steve Krisiloff, his afternoon, it's been a long day, now ended at Michigan International Speedway. Here is Rick Mears as he, are, excuse me, this is Bill Olson as he is pulling around Phil Kaliva and there is quite a battle now beginning to build for third place once again. Alsop is currently in third behind Al Unzer, but back just a bit is Gary Bettenhausen and he is battling with Rick Mears who has been able to move up and join in this battle. Is it Gary or is it Tony? It is Tony in car number 16 sitting in fourth place right now. All right, Bancho Carter, the leader. Al Unser is running second. Bill Alsop, as we look forward to that battle for third, then Tony Bentonhausen and Rick Mears, the top five at the Michigan 500, 176 laps complete. The race covering 250 laps. Everyone in the third place battle had pulled up for a second there and, and looked like they were going to really begin racing once again. But apparently, they have all now decided that pacing is smarter. The, the drizzle that we mentioned earlier that was possible does not appear nearly as possible. It's lightened up a bit here. So I think now everybody has said, let's take it easy for a while. We still have quite a distance to go. If we're in a pacing situation, when do they make their charge? You make your charge really in the last, after your last, uh, after your last pit stop. Once you've taken on the fuel, you know it's lightening up. Let's go ahead and run to the finish, but let's get to that last pit stop first. All right, let's go down to Bruce Jenner. Bruce. 
Charlie, I'm in a pit right now. There's an awful lot of tension. Right over my left shoulder is John Caples, the crew chief for Pancho Carter. We're going to try to get his attention because he's a busy man right now. John, can we talk to you for one second? Right at the beginning of the race, uh, Pancho was right up there. He qualified very well. If you could turn around a little yeah. bit, we're live so they could see your face. He did very well. But then just before the red, he ran into some trouble, went back a little bit. I talked to him during the red flag. He was a little dejected because he was a lap down. But now he's right in there. Well, we were... We gambled and made the lap up and hit some yellow flags right. We've got two more stops. We're coming in right now for what should be our next to last fuel stop if everything goes well. We were very fortunate making up a lap with these guys. That doesn't usually happen. We're happy about that and we're trying to hang in there. The car seems to be running very well. I've been watching your times about between high 180s to low 190s for the car, so everything seems to be going well. Yes, the chassis and the engine are performing just like you would want a race car to perform. It's very hard sometimes to get that to happen, but we try hard, and today seems to be a fairly good day at this moment. We've got a long way to go. We certainly do. Here comes right into the pits. All right, Pancho's coming into the pits. Next to last pit stop for Carter. Bruce, go ahead. Pancho Carter just came into the pits. Now, they don't expect to do anything different. They're just going to change the tires, put some fuel in it. Seems to be a very quick, they're ready to go. Just finishing up the fuel right now. A little bit of encouragement from his pit crew. He throws the bottle out. Got a little bit of refreshment for the driver. And 15.8 on the pit stop. Very fast, Pancho Carter. Right now, everything seems to be going well for him. Charlie? And Pancho has one pit stop to go, according to their plan. If their plan works right, just one more. Their plan on, on suspension settings is working because they didn't have to change tires at all. Al Unser picked the lead up while Pancho Carter was in the pits. Now, does Unser still have two pit stops left? They should all be on approximately the same situation. We've been running green for some time, so I would say two more for, for Al, definitely. Two more, really, for everyone. A total of 180 laps complete. And, of course, they would like to pick pick the pit stop up during a yellow. Now we watch Bobby Hillen's Longhorn Racing Team to do, see what they're going to decide, whether or not they're going to bring their driver in soon. Al Unser is the leader at the moment. And Al Unser brings his machine down pit road and is ready for a pit stop under the green flag. This, too, should be a stop for fuel only. There is Al into the pits. He is the leader. Bill Alsop will pick up the lead now. As he comes across the line, Alsop is now our leader because Al Unser is in the pits. Again, no tire change, routine stop, and Al Unser is underway. And he's out in 13.7, so a little quicker pit stop than Pancho Carter. 181 laps complete and a margin of two seconds in the pit stop between Pancho Carter and Al Unser. Let me tell you, when you're standing there making that pit stop or sitting in the driver's seat, two seconds is an eternity. Al Ols or Bill Alsop leads. Al Unser made his stop. And we watch to see if Alsop's crew is going to prepare for a stop. They have their equipment on, but Alsop comes around and completes lap 182 at speed. Bill Alsop, the leader. And Rick Mears, now running fourth, came in and out of the pits very quickly. You know, Bill Alsop said an interesting thing when we first started experimenting with the camera on his car, which has stopped working, but it's the only thing that stopped working on the car. He was so happy because he was going faster than he ever did before with it. And he came to me and he said, you know, Paul, if this keeps up, everybody's going to want one of these. Now he's leading. I wonder what they're going to say. Everybody put a toy camera there just for more speed. We wait for a pit stop from Bill Alsop, and the crew is really stretching the time on this stop. 183 laps complete, Michigan 500 at the Michigan International Speedway. We'll be back with more action in a moment. under yellow. Reason for the yellow. Okay. 
Did he maintain the lead? Yep. Okay. Let's use that for a second. Just show him. We are under the yellow due to uh, oil on the track. That is A.J. Foyt's car that is now being carried away. A.J. now in the hospital in Ann Arbor. The last report that we had was an excellent report, and we'll try and update that for you before the race is, is over. We have now completed 185 laps. We have 65 laps still to go. And this is the NBC camera in Bill Alsop's car. Now, the reason for the camera, the camera is still working. That is simply oil on that plastic cover that we have in front of it. It is messy out there. Well, they're certainly spraying a lot of oil, and they're beginning to now wave some of the cars around the pace car as they try to reset the order from the scoring. And as you just saw from on board Bill's car, they waved him past, told him to go on around. They continue to do that. They're trying to pick up Al Unser, who should be the leader now, according to our scores here. There's Al Unser. He should be the leader, but everybody's being allowed to go around and come up right behind the leader, including Pancho Carter and Bill Olson. So unofficially at this moment, we have Al Unser, Pancho Carter, Bill Olson, Bob Lazier, Tony Bittenhausen, the top five in that order, followed by Tom Bigelow, Rick Mears, Gary Bittenhausen, Scott Brayton, and Bill Vukovic. We have completed now 186 laps. 250 lap race. This is a two mile oval here at the Michigan International Speedway. And this, of course, the Michigan 500. Live coverage, flag to flag, 500 miles. First time in television sports history. And the safety crews at Michigan International are taking a good, hard look at the back straightaway. Make sure there's not too much oil on it or if there aren't some parts lying out there. Doing their walk down and trying to make sure that they know that this is a good safe racetrack to run on. And what you mentioned about parts of course brings to mind what happened to Johnny Rutherford. He believes that on the back straight is that he picked up some kind of trash and that shredded his tire spun him. He did a complete 360 and fought his way all the way back to the pits. But then they said there is just no way that he could continue the race. Pancho Carter taking advantage of this yellow has brought the machine back in again. They're changing the right rear and the right front. They did not change tires just a few laps ago. Apparently, they have elected to make a change now. Let's go down to Gary Gerald. Paul, we're down here with Bobby Hillen in the Al Unser pit. Bobby, is there any concern about enough fuel to go the distance at the rate here? Uh, no, uh, Gary, we don't have any concern about the fuel at all. It looks like we have one more pit stop and, and uh, make it all right. You're anticipating that at what point? Now, you were just checking uh, here. If we went green right now, I would anticipate that at approximately lap 214 to 218, but it depends on how many yellows are posted. I know it's been a struggle through much of this season for you right now. Are you starting to get the hopes up? Uh, I'm, too, I'm too afraid to get my hopes up, but we're, we're running real well. We're running real consistently, and uh, we'll just hope for the best. We'll see what happens. All right, Bobby Hillen, guarded optimism, I think, is probably the key word down here in the Al Unser pit right now. Uh, that's a great description. All right, we'll be back with more of the Michigan 500 from the Michigan International Speedway right after these messages from your local station. talking to me Matthew huh? 16 I think they brought one in but I didn't okay. see I see all that phone and that powder down there at lap uh, pit 38 there's only 11 out there now. There's two in the pits. It'll be 13. There's 12 going out. Let me count them again. 12, 13. Uh, Gary? Oh, here's 
14, Jerry Carl. Yeah. We're back at the Michigan 500, 188 laps complete. We started with 37 cars. We now have 14 cars remaining. The strategy now becomes a very interesting situation. Under the yellow, a lot of these cars, it, Bob Lazier is an example who's already done it, decided to dart into the pits and pick up just a little more fuel. And if they could anticipate the back to green well, they might even do it on the last lap. Then they would stretch that next pit stop, hopefully a little closer to the checkered flag. So the strategy on this pit stop here, this should be the last lap of yellow flag. Al Unzer has made his stop. We've already heard Bobby Hillen say that he will bring the car in at about lap 214. So in reality, the leaders all with one pit stop remaining in the race. Equipment still out on the track, so I suspect we have yet another lap of yellow flag. Pancho Carter anticipating the start. Bill Alsop, Tony Bettenhausen all sitting up there in the front. Currently the lineup is Allens are in front, Tony Bettenhausen in second, or Bill Alsop in second, Tony Bettenhausen in third. Pancho Carter in fourth and Bob Lazier in fifth place. And you're looking at Tony Bettenhausen on the left of your screen, Pancho Carter on the right. And so far the weather which plagued us last Sunday where the race was scheduled to go has held off. Although for moments we had a very light drizzle that was about an hour ago. And of course in case you joined us late, we were under a red flag. Race was stopped for one hour and 35 minutes and that was for a near disaster fire in Herm Johnson's pit. It looked terrible at the time. It spread to a couple of other pits, but they were able to bring it under control. There were about five or six injuries, but nothing super serious. Although when you are burned, as we did have several people uh, burned, there were minor burns for the reports that we have. Uh, we really got away with one that could have really could have been a disaster. Well, I think they were extremely fortunate. Once again, I think I think we've seen enough warnings now. Somebody's going to have to make some decisions on what to do. The leader is Al Unzer. It is interesting, too. Bill Alsop is in second place. You can see the interval sitting back there. It is interesting, Charlie, that sometimes some of these crews will actually go so far as to hire an airplane or a helicopter to fly out and find the edge of a system and radio back to the pits exactly where the edge of the system is so they can plan the end of the race. I don't think anyone has done that today, though. Though they don't tell anybody when they do it. Now we will keep an eye on Pancho Carter when the green flag comes out to see if he's able to make the quick move that he wants to. He's currently running in fourth place behind Al Unser, Bill Alsop, and Tony Bittenhausen. The green flag is out. Al Unser brings her down across the line, is the leader at the conclusion of 191 laps. And the rest of the field chases across. Pancho Carter has set up behind Gary Bentonhausen and moves past Bentonhausen. So now he should set sights on the back end of Al a Bill Alsop's machine. So Pancho Carter is making his charge once again, and he is really picking up speed. Bill Alsop just in front of him as Pancho Carter now in third place, and he's going to try hard for second. And Carter has the line underneath, and he just goes breezing by. So Pancho Carter making good use of his fine machine now is chasing Al Unzer, the leader, as he breezed past Bill Alsop and moved her into second place. So now Pancho Carter has Bill Kaliva, the slower car in front of him, and then one other slow car, and then he chases Al Unzer, the leader. Now the strategy becomes Al Unzer and Pancho Carter. When do you take that last pit stop, and when do you make the charge? Well, Pancho Carter, I think now, figures this is a sprint race. He goes to the distance now. He has one other stop. He's hoping to make that smoothly, cleanly. He's got fresh tires on the right-hand side. So he is going, I'm sure, to make it a sprint. Of course, that's what he's best at. He's a former sprint car champion. 58 laps to go. Pancho Carter in second place. Al Unser is the leader. Well, Pancho Carter is running 
very, very well, very smoothly. Obviously, we heard Johnny Cables earlier say that the car was doing everything they wanted it. He's driving any place on the racetrack he wants to. Here is Al Unser. He is the leader at the moment. He is out in front of Poncho Carter, and he has the advantage of a clear racetrack in front of him. And as they come by, we'll try to set up the interval between Al Unser and Poncho Carter. Al Unser brings it down to the line. There goes Unser pass. Now Poncho Carter is chasing. And Poncho Carter comes by just about 3.7 seconds behind Al Unser. We've now completed 194 laps. We have 56 laps to go. This will be a very exciting finish, obviously, because we're watching two fine drivers begin to close now. For Al Unser especially, who has been working so hard with this Longhorn race car to be able to bring it up to full race speed, develop it. It's a new car. They've done a lot of work on it, and I think they believe they deserve a victory, and Al certainly driving like it. And for Al Unser, this is his 18th year of driving championship cars, and he has a total of 36 wins to his credit, including three Indianapolis championship. For Al Unser, too, this is not the only race that he's interested in this weekend. He is also racing on Paul Newman's racing team at the Can-Am at Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin at Road America. When he's done here, then he'll want to head up. Now Al Unser is slowing. Al Unser, the leader, slowed down. Pancho Carter's moved past. Blue smoke, it looks like an engine situation again. We were just talking about elation. Now we're talking about disappointment as Al Unser pulled it down off the line, and the machine has given up. Pancho Carter moves into the lead. Oh, what a terrible disappointment for Al Unser. Gary Gerald is working his way to Al Unser's pit, and so as soon as we get that set up and Al comes in, we'll have a report on the situation. What Al, a disappointing afternoon. Al takes it so very seriously. He is so intense in his race driving. Usually when he climbs out of the car, he needs three or four minutes just to settle down. The disappointment is so keen for that gentleman. So we may hold off before going to Gary Gerald. Good point. It's, it's just something that you simply can't do. They, they've got to slow down. The adrenaline has to stop. Let's go down to Gary Gerald as he watches Al Unser unbuckle. Well, Paul, it's like you say, a moment that any race driver, you, you just, I don't think we can put ourselves in that spot. The disappointment has to be so keen. Bobby Hillen just pulled the headset off just before the car came in and said, we heard it the last time by something in the motor. We think we probably dropped a valve. Al quickly clamoring out. He still has the helmet on and the crew now going to work back in the motor department there as they'll make a preliminary analysis. But it would appear that very definitely this afternoon of combat for Al Unser, who has not won since Phoenix 1979 in IndyCar competition, will come to a very disappointing close. Perhaps uh, after Al has an opportunity to think things over, we'll get an opportunity to chat with him. We'll just have to wait and see. And the picture tells the story between the driver and the owner, Bobby Hillen and Al Hunter. A shrug of the shoulders. He was doing so well. And then suddenly in the lead, which is the most disappointing position. It's bad enough any time you have the car go, but when it goes in the lead like that, so close to the finish. And you had just a glimpse on the right hand of Al Unser, the championship ring from Indianapolis. Three times a winner at Indianapolis. Poncho Carter, car number five, is in the lead. An exciting story, too. Just behind him in the blue number 16, Tony Bettenhausen, who's never done this well in any Indy-type car before. He is only one and a half second back. Now, let me point something else out. Pancho Carter is leading. He has not won an IndyCar race. Tony Bittenhausen is running second. He has not won. Bob Lazier is running third. He's a rookie. He has not won. Bill Alsop is running fourth, and he has not run. You've got to go to the fifth place. Rick Mears, who has nine wins before you can find a driver that has won a championship car race. And Rick Mears is almost a full lap back. So in reality, we could well have a first-time winner here today at the Michigan 500. 200 Separate. laps complete, 50 to go. Separation between Pancho Carter and Tony Bettenhausen is now 1.9 seconds. Car number 16, Tony Bettenhausen, at 29 years of age, veteran NASCAR driver in his third year of championship car, running in second behind Pancho Carter. Pancho Carter out in front, Tony Bettenhausen in second. Bob Lazier has managed to stay in there and stay in the fight, as has Bill Alsop. So 
It's been a very exciting piece of movement for these cars. I think it bears saying again that none of them have won, so there are a lot of desperate men out there. You begin to get a little edgy about this time of the race, too. 49 laps to go, 201 complete. Mancho Carter running smoothly. The nature of the race has maintained itself now. They really seem to be happy to maintain the positions they're in. There is Tony Bentonhausen, fine young fellow, worked for years just as a gopher, as somebody who went and cut parts and washed pieces and did anything that anybody wanted them to do. The word is gopher, go for this and go for that. It's a, it's a rubber term in racing, though. It's how you pay your dues. He's paid his dues, and now they're paying off. Pancho Carter in the lead. He will make one more pit stop, the report from his crew. And wants to continue just sailing along as Tony Bentonhausen has not been able to close that much on him right now. But of course, we still have a lot of racing yet to go. For those of you that have been away for the NBC Nightly News, welcome back to the Michigan 500. We have 205, now 206 laps complete. 44 laps to go. Al Unzer was leading this race, and then all of a sudden, while in the lead, the engine let go on the back stretch, and Al Unzer came out of the race. As a result of that, Pancho Carter has now picked up first place, and he is running very well at the moment. In second place, in car number 16 is Tony Bettenhausen. In third place, we have Bob Lazier and Bill Alsop. In car number seven is sitting back in fourth place. You're looking at Bob Lazier. There is Bill Alsop as they come around, and most of the first four positions seem satisfied just to maintain position at the moment. And we will mention again that the first four positions of Pancho Carter, Tony Bentonhausen, Bob Lazier, and Bill Alsop, they are all looking for their first championship car win. Now the crews are doing a little bit of calculating. 207 laps into the race. In the next 10 laps, Pancho Carter, the leader, probably will make a pit stop. Now, he stopped twice into the last yellow. The second time, the reason was simply to pick up the right side tires. But when they did that, they also hooked up the fuel. So maybe he can now push it to lap 220, 221. They're waiting to see if a yellow flag will come out for whatever reason. Hopefully not an accident, debris, oil on the racetrack. So now you have to wait. You sit there very, very patiently. You know fuel's running out of the tank. What you want to do is hopefully wait for that yellow if it comes out. So the game of cat and mouse is underway. Pancho Carter leads. Tony Bittenhausen is running second. In car number 16, Bob Lazier is running third. Bill Alsop is fourth. Rick Mears is running fifth, but he is back quite a ways, followed by Tom Bigelow, Gary Bittenhausen, Scott Brayton, and now Bill Kaliva is in ninth place. But in reality, the top four, Pancho Carter, Tony Bittenhausen, Bob Lazier, and Bill Alsop are the four major factors of the race now with 209 laps complete. And I think it bears saying one more time that first place, Pancho Carter, second place, Tony Bentonhausen, third place, Bob Lazier, and Bill Alsop. None of them have ever won a championship race. Car number 16 is Tony Bittenhausen, 29 years of age. Running in second place, Pancho Carter, the leader. Pancho is 30. So we have the two youngsters, Pancho Carter and Tony Bittenhausen, running 1-2. And then Bob Lazier at age 42 and Bill Alsop at age 43 are running 3-4. and four. Bill Alsop has now begun to do battle with Rick Mears, and Mears has actually been able to push past Alsop and pick up fourth place. So Bill Alsop is now sitting back in fifth. Tony Bentonhausen running smoothly in second place. Again, we started the afternoon with 37 cars on the grid, the normal 33, plus two that qualified uh, as the promoter's option, and two more that qualified in a qualifying race last Saturday, and that took the total to 37. But we've had quite an attrition rate here today. And we are down to less than 15 cars. Our unofficial count was 13. And that is it. We now have 13 cars left out of the 37 that started. One of the big questions before this race started was fatigue. The ability to take those lateral G-forces lap after lap after lap for 500 miles. And 
have never been done in an IndyCar to this point. We have had some problems on the racetrack, accidents. We don't know if they are fatigue related, but I think we can safely say one thing. These are some very tired race drivers. Now, we have many people that have joined us late, particularly in the East. Update two things that happened today. We had a pit fire in Herm Johnson's pit. Red flag, it was the race was stopped for about an hour and 35 minutes. And then we also had A.J. Foyt going into the fence in turn two. He has been taken by a helicopter to the hospital in Ann Arbor. The last report that we have, there is a leg injury on his left leg, an arm injury to his right arm, but he was kibitzing with the nurses in the hospital. So A.J. seems to be uh, all right. It's just going to take a little time for all of the injuries to uh, to heal. One tough Texan and almost impossible to keep town. A.J. Foyt, a tremendous race car driver. Pancho Carter, the leader of the Michigan 500, has now completed 213 laps. This is a two mile oval and it's a bank track, 18 degrees in the turns. The front straight is banked at 12 degrees, the back straight at 5 degrees. Bob Lazier in third place, car number 35, running smoothly. There's just under two seconds separating first and second, and they have been maintaining those positions for the past several laps now. There's, there's the interval now between first place. That's Pancho Carter coming through the turn, and Tony Bettenhausen behind him. Bettenhausen not closing that much, as you said, content to sit here, we'll wait till the final pit stop that they will be making within in all probability the next seven to ten laps and then the sprint for the finish. I think it's worthy of note too as we watch the first two places to point out that sitting back in seventh place is Tony Bettenhausen's brother Gary a real veteran of championship racing and Tom Bigelow another longtime veteran of championship racing is currently sitting in sixth place. Yellow flag is out. Yellow is out. Can we pick it up. Car rolling slowly on the back stretch after Ooh. hitting the wall. Bad damage to the right side. It comes to a stop. It Larry is Larry Cannon. Cannon, car number 99. But he climbs out of the machine, unstraps. And he's had a rough afternoon. He's been in and out of the pits. He had all kinds of problems. He was the first car to come into the pits. They did some work on the car, but he stayed with it. A tenacious fellow, Larry Cannon. Goes with the nickname Boom Boom. And he is now smacked the fence, smacked it hard, heavy damage to the right side. Poncho Carter is our leader. And 215 laps, so it's an ideal time for the pit stop, and Poncho Carter takes advantage of it. And this is exactly what he wanted to do. Well, he didn't want to do it in this way, certainly, not with a car having an accident. But second place, Tony Bettenhausen comes in. You saw him pass by at the bottom. Let's see who comes out first. Let's go to Bruce Jenner. Pancho Carter in the pits just hasn't done much. He's taking a little bit of fuel. Now, they're looking for this yellow because as John Cable said, his crew chief said they'd come in on about 100 or 220th lap. They're coming in earlier. He has a little bit of trouble getting out of the pits. He came in a little earlier to take advantage of that yellow flag. But Pancho Carter is back in this race. So Carter comes out a little quicker pit stop for Bentonhausen. And there is Bentonhausen coming off the pits right behind Carter. So first and second place coming out. Carter's crew was a little bit faster, especially considering that Bettenhausen was well down the track. All right, we're under the yellow, 216 laps complete. We'll be back with more of our coverage of the Michigan 500 right after these messages from your local station. All right, this is Charlie Jones along with Paul Page, Gary Gerald, and Bruce Jenner. And that's one of the uh, better views from high above the Michigan International Speedway as you can look down on the Michigan 500 from our helicopter shot. And of course we've had quite an attrition rate. We started today with 37 cars. These are the ones that went out very early in the race. To give you uh, an update on in case you joined us late a particular driver that you might be interested in. And we have uh, really weeded the drivers down. Rutherford, Tom Sneva, Dick Simon coming out. That was on lap 136 when Simon came out. Harry McDonald, of course, blew his engine. As a result of that, they had to bring a yellow flag out. Osele Garza, another blown engine, overheating for the Krysilov machine, blowing engine for Mosley. So attrition on the equipment is really beginning to show. And of course, the last one, Larry Cannon lost a tire, hit the wall. That is the reason for the yellow now. And Al Unser came out when he was in the lead. 
blown engine, fatigue constantly, and on the racing engines, on the Cosworth engines. They were failing rather regularly there for a while. So we have 12 cars and drivers remaining. Now completing 218 laps of this 250 lap race. Now we have the pit stops done under this yellow. The championship cars here carry 40 gallons of fuel. They should get ideally 1.8 miles to the gallon. That scenario seems to have played out. That would mean 36 laps once they have filled the cars and assuming that they got a full fuel load. So if that is true, then this should be a sprint to the finish. Now, you're a crew chief. You get out your little arithmetic and try to find out, is your car really getting that mileage? Is it going to make it to the end of the race? And how much can the driver play with the boost in the race car? 31 laps to go. And we now have 12 cars remaining in the race, not including this one. Larry Cannon lost a wheel, took the car up into the wall. Heavy damage to the right side of his race car. It is still Carter, a bit, leader. it's a hazy afternoon. Go ahead, Paul. Pancho Carter is our leader. He comes around smoothly, and I still am, well, I'm excited certainly about Pancho, but I am excited, too, about the second and third place. Tony Bentonhausen, Bob Lazier, none of them have ever won a championship race. During the yellow flag, you have a chance to shift around in the cockpit, look around and see where you're at. I imagine they're all giggling to themselves just because they're that close to the lead. And here is a look at Pancho Carter. We are still under the yellow. We have had a plethora of yellow flags today, plus the red flag that came out because of the fire in the pits. And let's go back to see what happened very early on in the race. Well, it was certainly a frightening moment. The hose dumped fuel all over the pit area. The fire lit up. The refueler, you can see, is reacting from the heat. Herm Johnson climbed out of the car. They loaded the fire bottles onto him, and then the fire spread, and the hose blew off the front of the fuel tank. Fire trucks were brought in from everywhere. There is the explosion as the fuel hose came off, and it rocked that fuel tank. And everyone took off running. It was certainly a frightening moment and a very dangerous moment. And then A.J. Foyt, late in the race, got into the wall coming off of turn two. It looked like something broke on the race car. He smacked the wall, then slid along it and stayed up against it. Foyt is now at a hospital. He's reported conscious. He has several fractures, but he's also giving the nurses some trouble. So he's apparently in at least halfway decent shape. We are still under the yellow now with 220 laps complete, 30 laps to go. Johnny Rutherford, of course, had a problem in the back straight going into turn three. He believes he picked up some debris, shredded the right rear tire, did a 360, a beautiful piece of driving. Then he headed out, turned it, stayed underneath the line, and brought it all the way into the pits. He wanted to go back out again. But of course, he wasn't able to. They just need to do too much work on the car. And so that ended the afternoon for Johnny Rutherford. You know, these cars have two-way radio communication with their pits. And Johnny Rutherford can be wonderfully eloquent at a moment like this. That might have been a fine conversation to listen to. We may have had to bleep it a bit, though, I have a feeling at that time. And we also had a camera in the car. And that is an... Onboard camera of Bill Alsop. We'll go back to the start of the race, and this is what it looked like from a driver's standpoint if you were in the third row. You saw the green light come on, the green flag come out from Bill Alsop's car in the third row, and watched him accelerate right along with the field. And Bill Whittington lost control and had this spin, but you saw it from this angle as well as onboard the car. Whittington over to the left, right across the front of Alsop's machine as he dives low. And now Al Unser, as we mentioned, uh, has been out of the race now for a few laps. Let's go down to Gary's with it. Gary? Well, we're standing back in the garage area now, and it's a dejected Al Unser who, whose car performed so brilliantly. And I suppose the closer you get to the victory, the more pointed the disappointment is. Yeah, it is. Everybody wants to know how tired I am. I'm more disappointed than I'm tired. So <laughs> it's just one of those days, you know. You, the whole team worked very hard today, and... We had a, at least a chance at it, and the motor broke, so here we are. Can you find optimism at all in the fact that the car was working? I know you said all along this season it's been a struggle getting it up to speed. You were making the progress, then it, it looked like you were right there today battling for the lead or holding the lead much of the afternoon. Well, it's when this has been one of these 
weeks or two weeks, whatever you want to call it, that the car had all problems with it. We haven't been happy with the way it's been handling. And this morning when I came back from, uh, from the uh, Can-Am cars from yesterday, we made some more changes to it and just uh, hope for the best, and here we are. Well, we hope that your day tomorrow in the Can-Am competition is better than this one today, Al. So do I. Thank you very much. Let's go to Bruce Jenner now. This is John Caples, Poncho Carter's crew chief, and uh, can Poncho make it to the to the finish line without any more fuel? Yeah, we're all right on our fuel. We have a little bit of a chassis condition that's bothering and aggravating our right front tire. Our last tire change, our right rear was a little smaller than the rest, and so we're understeering a little bit. We're just trying to stay in front of uh, Bettenhausen uh, at the speed we're running to try to conserve everything. We have a little more speed left, but uh, with that right front the way it is, we'd like not to have to use it that hard if we don't have to. Yeah. Just time to sort of cross your fingers, huh? Well, I got them crossed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. We'll be back with more of the Michigan 500 right after these messages. And it's an exciting race, and we're looking forward to an exciting afternoon. Thank you. Tony Bittenhausen is running second, and this race is distilled down to these two cars, at number five, Pancho Carter, and number 16, Tony Bittenhausen. And Tony Bittenhausen is staying just over a second behind Pancho Carter, trying to keep up, trying to keep the leader in sight, and being ever aware of anything else that's happening on the race course, a slower car, anything that might give him the opportunity to pull up and pass the leader, Pancho Carter. And let's mention once again that Pancho Carter, in his eighth year of driving, Indy cars and Tony Bittenhausen in his third year, neither one have won an IndyCar race. So the battle between Pancho Carter and Tony Bittenhausen is out in front. Roger Penske has two cars running in positions in the top five. Rick Mears has moved up to third place, passing Bill Alsop, who sits in fourth place, to do so, both of the Penske cars. And we have 20 laps to go in the Michigan 500, a 250 lap race here at the Michigan International Speedway. Total purse of more than half a million dollars and the winner will receive more than $100,000. Pancho Carter ever so smoothly cocks the back end just a little bit every time he comes on to that fourth turn. Tony Bettenhausen just stays in there and stays following. 1.3 seconds behind the leader. Pancho Carter, the leader, and early we had a chance to uh, talk with him, and we asked him, will this really be a flat-out, high-speed race? And here is Pancho's answer. No, not really. During the race, if the car is working properly, you can run flat out during the race, too. The only thing you got to watch out for is traffic, or if the car starts changing uh, its handling characteristics a little bit, or the track changes a little bit. Then you're going to have to correct for that and make sure that uh, you still can run as fast as you can, but you're a little hesitant with the throttle instead of just barreling in there flat out like we do qualifying. I have a feeling, though, right now, he uh, feels like he's qualifying. He's going to be going flat out a sprint race to the checker flag. Well, in that last lap, Tony Bettenhausen picked up uh, ever so much on Pancho Carter. He is now under one second. He is actually 0.9 tenths of a second behind Pancho Carter and closing down on him. We have completed 232 laps, 18 laps to go. Tony Bettenhausen in car number 16, Pancho Carter in car number five. They come across the line. He's picked up a bit more, six tenths of a second now. So either Pancho Carter is slowing or Tony is gaining. But whatever it is, obviously we're going to have quite a fight for the lead here shortly. So Pancho coming out of turn two, down the back straight. Bettenhausen right behind him. Tony holding the same distance in second place. Now into turn three. Small increments of time, it's very hard to try and determine what might be happening there. But if we add the information that we gained from Johnny Caples, Pancho's crew chief, that they are they are having problems in the suspension on the right side of the car that they would prefer not to have, then I think it is for the moment at least safe to assume that Pancho Carter's having some handling problems and Tony Bettenhausen is taking advantage of them. And we have 16 laps to go. Again, out of turn two and down the back straight. Let's go down to Gary Gerald. 
Well, here's Bob Lazier, and I know it's a great disappointment, Bob. It has to be a thrill at the same time as this bittersweet disappointment just because you were running with the leaders this late in a 500-mile race. Yes, uh, Gary, I really felt very good that uh, the crew seems to feel that we might have been leading the race even. So uh, I, I think this has been a very confusing race. And uh, because of it, uh, uh, we don't really know where we were, but we were running well. No one passed me all day. You know, the chassis is a three-year-old or a three-season-year-old chassis, and uh, uh, I think the, the team really put out an effort, and we've got a, a good shot today. Got a lot of fans down at this end, Bob. Congratulations. I know it's still a disappointment. Let's go now to Bruce Jenner, standing by with Jerry Carl. Right now, Jerry Carl and Jerry. You know, we did a piece earlier today about the, the big team, the more expensive team, the Penske, and yourself, who comes here on a very low budget. Penske's had his problems today. I guess sometimes it's even no matter how much money you got in the bank. Well, that's kind of what happened to us today, too. You know, we, we were running pretty good. We were up there running 185, 186 all day, and I guess we were about seventh when uh, the clutch gave up on me. And uh, it's just uh, one of these things, you know, the clutch had a couple of races on it, and, and uh, we mic'd it up before we came here, and uh, we decided to... Uh, to run it instead of putting a new one in and it, it's uh that's the difference between having a a, a good budget and uh, and going on a low on a low budget you know you use things that uh, are questionable sometimes and it cost us uh, we were right up there running sixth or seventh and then the clutch went out but i think it's, it's been a great day and uh a real competitive race and i just really like to thank roger penske and uh uh, I'd like to thank PPG for uh, sticking with us this year, you know, and I hope they come back and we'll do All it again right. next year. We'll see what happens, as always, next year. All right. All right, let's go back to Charlie Jones. All right, thank you, Bruce. As Tony Bentonhausen continues to close on Pancho Carter as they go down the back straight, we have completed 237 laps, 13 laps to go. All right, we'll be back with more of the Michigan 500. We'll take you to the conclusion right after these messages from your local station. Just over nine and a half laps to go. It is Pancho Carter and Tony Bettenhausen in the battle for the victory. Bettenhausen has been whittling away. He is now just three tenths of a second back. For a moment, he was right up on the back end of Pancho's car, and I think Pancho saw him and decided that was too close for comfort and nailed the throttle and the boost hard and has put this interval of three tenths of a second between them. As they come across the line, still 33 hundredths of a second separates first and second. So it is Pancho Carter leading the way through turn one. He heads for turn two. Tony Bettenhausen in car number 16 is running second, and that is the battle at the Michigan 500 as we are coming to the closing laps. We have 241 laps complete. Pancho Carter, the leader. Tony Bittenhausen is running second. Rick Mears is third, followed by Bill Alsop, then Tom Bigelow, Gary Bittenhausen, Scott Brayton, Bill Kaliba, Roger Rager, and Larry Dixon. But the story involves the two young drivers, 30-year-old Pancho Carter and 29-year-old Tony Bittenhausen. Well, this is the battle on the racetrack. Pancho Carter and Tony Bettenhausen, the battle for the lead. Let's go to the pits. Here's Gary Gerald. Paul, this is Paul Deatlovich, the crew chief for young Tony Bettenhausen. Paul, you're so excited here. You got a real rooting section going oh, in this pit. I'll tell you, we're all uh, we're all out here. We're enjoying the race. Uh, most of my help that we have is free help, so they get a pretty good charge out of it. We're a new team. This is our first year out. We have a seven-year-old car, and we're pretty excited. Five hours ago, did you have any idea in your mind that you might be battling for the lead in this race? Uh, I didn't know about battling for the lead. I knew we'd be battling for a top five spot. How about, how about strategy now in these last few laps? Well, we made our strategy the last pit stop. We pitted under the yellow. It looked like we may have to pit uh, two more times. As it looks, uh, we only had to make the one pit stop, and we're going to go to the end on this. All right, Paul Dyatlovich, the crew chief for Tony Bettenhausen, who continues to stalk Pancho Carter in the sprint toward the checkered flag. And we're closing in on a total of 500 miles, and they look at the distance between the car leading Pancho Carter's and Tony Bettenhausen, who is running second. It is about a third of a second in time. Three tenths of a second this far in the race, as you said, coming to 500 miles. In Indy cars, that is quite amazing for them to be running this close after this long. Pancho Carter and Tony Bettenhausen, 244 laps complete. We're coming up 
to completion of the lap number 245. We'll have five to go. This is a point in the race. I know we've said it before, but it certainly bears saying again. When, if you're in the lead and you're running smoothly, you start listening to, to see what might be going wrong. And all of the things that have happened to you in your past, all of the things that have gone wrong, begin to come to mind once again. And you wonder, will this part make it? Will that part make it? Or maybe you even know something. You've heard a little noise in the car, or you've watched one of the gauges flicker, and you wonder what's going to happen. Pancho Carter's wife, as she watches in this race. His wife, Carla, they have one son who has been here at the track. In fact, he wears his father's helmet as they both run around together on, on a bicycle in the pits. Quite a devoted and an excellent father. Now working their way through lap traffic with four laps to go. Again, for Tony Bentenhausen or for Pancho Carter, the victory today would be their first in championship car racing. Two Penske cars sitting in third and fourth. Rick Mears in third. Bill Alsop in fourth. Tom Bigelow in fifth. And Tony Bettenhausen's brother Gary is in sixth place. And although Pancho Carter seems to be able to hold the margin over Tony Bettenhausen, many of the drivers will tell you at this point in the race, they would just as soon be in second as to be in the lead because then they can set up the leader to try and make that final pass. They could make it out of turn two. They might want to wait and challenge out of turn four take him on the inside and race him for the checkered flag. Of course, the other side of the argument may be simply can they keep up with one another? Is Tony Bettenhausen running flat out at this moment? I suspect that he is, and his job is to just try and inch his way up, but at the same time, be careful while he does it. There's Carla. As she looks down, looks around, boy, she is pulling for Pancho. Look at the tension. Roaring past the start finish line with two laps to go. Pancho Carter and Tony Bettenhausen. Still running smoothly. Still a battle right at the close has not yet developed. These are the cart races that Pancho Carter has done well at in 1981. And now he is trying to pick up a victory. Running ever so smoothly. should be displayed to Pancho Carter as he comes to the line. And there it is, two miles, one more lap to go for Pancho Carter. If he can make it to the back stretch, he can almost coast to the finish, were it not for Tony Bettenhausen sitting right behind him. So Pancho Carter still has to watch those rear view mirrors as Bettenhausen will try and close up. But it seems a fruitless task now as Pancho Carter screams down the back stretch and into the number three turn. The checkered flag will be waiting for him as he comes off of this lap. Pancho Carter, the last turn, the last lap, less than half a mile now as he screams toward the checkered flag and twin checkers are displayed to Pancho Carter and now to Tony Bettenhausen as he comes by. Look at Carla, look, she's crying. She's so happy with this victory. Pancho Carter has come home the winner of the inaugural Michigan 500 for IndyCars. It has been a long wait for Pancho Carter in his eighth year of driving championship cars, looking for that first win, and he picks it up in the Michigan 500. And an endurance test for car and for driver here today. And what a tremendous comeback for him. Pancho Carter, who in 1977 was in an extraordinarily serious crash at Phoenix International Raceway during a practice test. And now he is here, the victor today. He was badly injured, worked hard to come back. Let's go down to Bruce Jenner. Right now, I'm with a very happy lady, Carla. Congratulations. I noticed even after the win and all the cheers and everything, you still put down his last lap time, That's working right. right to the finish. My, our crew chief would kill me if I didn't get every lap. <laughs> I can't even believe it. I'm so happy. We've waited so long for this. You certainly have, and you deserve it. Thank you very much. All right, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> oh, what a happy lady. And deservedly so, as Pancho Carter now can slow down, relax, and recognize that he has won the first 500-mile race for Indy cars at Michigan International Speedway. Pancho Carter in number five, slowly down the backstretch that for so many laps, he cruised down at better than 190 miles an hour. 
Here's the unofficial order of finish. Pancho Carter wins. Tony Bettenhausen in second. Excellent Rick finish Rick in Tony. third. An excellent one for Tony. Bill Alsop, a fine finish two and fourth. And Tom Bigelow comes in in fifth. Unofficial results. The sixth position, Tony's brother Gary. Scott Brayton comes home in seventh. Phil Kaliva stayed in the race all day long and manages to pick up eighth. Larry Dixon, after hitting the wall, stays out with hasty repairs to his car in ninth, and Bob Lazier in tenth. And those ten cars were the only ten cars remaining on the track at the end of the race. And by the way, Bob Lazier has been voted as the rookie of the Michigan 500. And pulling in to victory circle now it is here is Pancho Carter in car number five. He receives a standing ovation as he pulls in. A popular victory here today. Congratulations to Pancho. Gary Gerald is there beside the car to get a quick word with him. Winning the race in car number go ahead Gary Pancho I know you're unbuckling I know this is one of those magic magic moments seven years ago at this racetrack you were second five times you've been second in your career now you've won one you hear the ovation of the crowd your feelings boy it's, it's just wonderful uh, I've been trying for a long time to do this and it's uh, it just really feels great we got behind there with a spin and I'm just amazed that uh, we got going the car work beautiful a lot of credit to the Alex Foods crew and uh, the chief mechanic John Caples and the car owner Alex Morales and all the guys on the crew they just did a great job it, it was really easy to drive it was like I said before the race if the car had handle you could go 500 miles here and it wouldn't be too bad I'm tired after running but not that tired after that spin did you think realistically you had any chance of winning this race no, not really. Uh, kind of jokingly, I told John, I said, don't worry, John. I said, we'll get the lap back. And we just kept working at it and working at it until we finally did. And the, the car handled just beautiful. And the guys really did a great job preparing it. And I think that proved by the fact that, that we finished alone. And uh, even with me abusing it a little bit in that spin. But it really was a, a great, you know, a great day for me. The tires, the, the Goodyear tires lasted just perfect. I had no real problem with them at all. It just, it was a perfect day. It's one of those great comeback stories. Congratulations, Pancho. There's a young guy here that I know he's going to remember this day, too. I think he will. All right, let's go back upstairs. 